fighting somehow lends itself to maybe people have some addictive personalities or oh, something like that? Oh, 100%. Like there's a there's a very common theme with fighters and, and majority of them come from a history of drug and alcohol abuse or like actual physical abuse. It really does replace whatever it was that created the addiction to alcohol. For me, it was always alcohol. Um, and the way that I was able to go sober was focusing on fighting. How are you made aware of uh, Kieran Fitzgibbons and CSA? I was sitting on the mats one day after cleaning him and I was going through Facebook and I saw this like highlight clip of Gina Carano and Kevin Ross and then it had Coach Kieran and I was like, oh my God, like these people are amazing. That's where I want to go. Have you always been receptive to coaches that tell you how it is? Honestly, I've left coaches because I felt like they were yes men. Okay. I felt like they weren't being honest with me. How do you lift for this sport? Honestly, I love powerlifting. Like I, I powerlifted before I started fighting. You were mentioning about the elbow, how when the arm bar was pulled, you were tapping. Now, was that a situation where you were tapping and it was apparent you were tapping or was it a situation where like she really just wanted to rock your elbow off? I remember tapping. I remember feeling my elbow dislocate, like felt it pop out and I went, oh, yep, I'm done. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, yeah. And tapping and then I felt everything tear mm. before she finally let it go. Yeah, and my elbow was out. It was dislocated. Then I was sitting on my knees and I, and I was holding my arm and I flexed my hand and it went straight back in. There's something about fighting that gave me freedom, especially being in the UFC. Like that one mistake could be the difference between you having a job and not having a job the next day. Like me being foreign as well and not being a resident out here or a, a US citizen yet is that if I lose my job, I lose my visa, which means I lose my ability to live here as well. I think I will always compete in something though. I have this idea that once I stop getting drug tests, I'll take a bunch of steroids and do like strongman competitions, but Really? Uh, yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was just <laughs> <laughs> back on the show. <laughs> Those oh, spiders yeah. that you guys got down there. You ever dealt with any of that? Like the big ones? Yeah, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, huntsmen. So uh <sighs> okay, so wait, 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 wait. So Americans Americans have this idea. It's like <laughs> It's like, okay, story time about my mom. I've been to Outback Steakhouse. I know. <laughs> you know exactly. Yeah. It all blew an onion. Yeah, see. You should see the first time I took my granddad to Outback Steakhouse, he was so angry. Oh, He's like, great. this isn't anything like home. What the f is a blue onion? <laughs> granddad, I told you. Bad Project Family has a go, and now, as you guys know, we have been talking about cold therapy for a while. Mark, Andrew, and myself, we all use cold plunge. XLs since we're pretty big, mm -hmm. but the cold plunge is amazing. And there are a lot of cold therapy tools out there. Obviously you can use your shower, but the amazing thing about the cold plunge is number one, it doesn't take up much space in your home or your backyard. And number two, you don't need to change your water unlike other cold therapy devices for six months to a year. It filters itself. Let's not even talk about all the benefits of cold plunging, like the dopamine release, how good you feel after doing it, and there's just the cascade of hormones that happens after you get in some really cold water. It's crazy, and we love it. So, Andrew, how can they get it? Absolutely. You guys got to head over to thecoldplunge.com, and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save $150 off your very own cold plunge. Again, thecoldplunge.com links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes hey Trevin let's just get you on that yeah, you microphone. got monster monster juice. There you, go. you got like some special juice with butterflies on it and stuff uh, this one's really good it's so good all the juice ones are my favorite but does that one have like 70 grams of sugar in it yeah that's what I was looking at <laughs> 48 48 it's not that bad you don't care you'll fight it all out of your system right I'm a big fan of carbs drop that <laughs> so, mic a little bit I think everybody's. Oh, a I'm fan. very short. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a fan of sugar. Oh yeah. I think uh, so. No, 100. percent I just have the benefit of training enough that I can eat as much as I want. Right. That's I'm sure. Cool. I'm sure my organs probably don't like it, but my body's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, uh, get everything checked out? Do you get like uh, blood work done, and like, are you pretty meticulous with? Trying I, to get as much health markers dialed I, in as you uh, can. I just had all my blood work done recently because um, I used to be a bad alcoholic. And so I was concerned about my liver, even though I know the liver regenerates, but there's like a certain level that it can get to where it doesn't right. regenerate anymore. Um, you might have been to that level. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty bad. Um, but I, I had like a couple of months where I was sparring and I was getting hurt to the liver over and over and over again. I was like, oh my God, something's wrong. And so I got a, I got my blood work done and they were like, your liver's fine. You're just being a baby. Uh, you just yeah. got punched in it. <laughs> yeah, you just got punched <laughs> and kicked in it. 
Um, but yeah, they just said I had kind of low testosterone, but I'd just gone off birth control. Mm. So I think it was that. And I haven't had it tested again. But oh. there's there's not a whole lot I can do about having there's low a, testosterone. a hack for us if we want to get on some testosterone. Just take some birth control. Get birth control, get birth control lower your testosterone, <laughs> right. elevate your estrogen. Yep. There you go. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think uh, it seems like there's a lot of fighters that have had uh, – a past where they've been addicted to certain things. Do you think that uh, fighting somehow lends itself to maybe people have some addictive personalities or oh, something like that? One hundred percent. Like there's a there's a very common theme with fighters, and and majority of them come from a history of drug and alcohol abuse or like actual physical abuse. You know, mm. um, and I really think that for me personally, fighting gave me something to channel that energy into, and there, there's like. Yeah, I don't know. It's so addictive. It it really does. It really does replace whatever it was that created the addiction to alcohol. For me, it was always alcohol. Um, and the way that I was able to go sober was focusing on fighting and and like setting goals within fighting that became bigger than my desire to drink alcohol. But it is. It's such a. I have so many friends in this industry that do have that exact same history of mm. drug and alcohol abuse, and I think something like wanting to beat the hell out of another person kind of takes a certain, a certain sort of mentality, you know, and a certain sort of person. Um, and so I definitely think there's a correlation between that type of person and having an addictive personality. Cause it is, it's like a weird amount. It's like not, I want to say like 90% of people I know mm. in this sport, with the exception of someone like GSP, who's a legitimate martial artist, majority, majority either currently have addiction issues or come from a history of addiction issues. I think maybe it's a little fight club-ish. Yeah. Like what you're fi <laughs> fighting yourself almost. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Well, think about it. Like what is drug and alcohol addiction? Like we, I, I used it to not have to deal with any of my issues, you know? And I've, I've definitely noticed um, I actually just went through this recently, I want to say 2019, uh, where coach and I had, had to have a big discussion about it, where I realized that I was using training the exact same way I used to use alcohol. You know, like I was feeling a lot of really negative feelings and I was struggling internally. And so I would just try to out physically outwork how I felt. And then that wasn't the answer either because I still wasn't dealing with whatever it was I was upset about, you know? Um, so I definitely think, that kind of makes sense. Like we go from from running away from our feelings and running away from our issues by numbing them with alcohol to then going to physically outwork them. And you have a certain level of success with that until you get to the top. And then you're like, oh, this is actually really, really mental as well. So if I'm mentally off, it doesn't matter what physical shape I'm in or like how technical I, I am. If I'm still feeling those negative feelings, like they come out in that moment when you're under the bright lights and when you're in front of everyone, then it's like, oh my God, every negative thing that I've ever said about myself comes out in this moment when I need to not, I need to not be feeling that, you know? Yeah. So it is that, that's kind of been, um, the battle for like the last couple of years. And honestly, having a coach like Kirian has helped me get through that so much, but I know I'm definitely not the only fighter that experiences that. How long was alcohol a problem for you? And like how early and then how long did it take for you to kick it after fighting or did it recur, come back here and there <laughs> through the career? Um, so I didn't start, di I didn't start drinking till I was 19 till my grandma died. So mm. when my grandma died, that's kind of, that's when I started, when I spiraled. Mm. And then I was working in nightclubs for a long time back in Australia. So definitely didn't help. People would always give me free drugs. Like yeah. I would get free, free drinks. You know, I managed the nightclubs. Everyone was like, oh, let us in. I'll give you a bag of pills. <laughs> bet let's do it you know <laughs> um and then so I was still doing that when I found kickboxing and I was just kind of making them exist together like I never I think at that time I didn't really realize how much of a problem it was and it was only um I realized it was a problem in 2018 because I went sober in July 2018 and it was because I lost a fight. I fought Jessica I on UFC Singapore. Um, and that whole camp, I was so unhappy. And so I drank the whole camp. The only time I didn't drink was in fight week when I was oh. in Singapore. Yeah. Mm. And then I lost that and went, man, I got to make some changes. The first thing that went was alcohol. So I've been four years sober now. Um, so I got rid of that. And then once I got rid of that, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm in a really toxic work environment. Like, And then I had to leave my coach, leave my gym and make a bunch of different changes. But if I hadn't have realized that the alcohol was such a big issue, I don't think I would have made all those other changes. Like it was real hard for about a year, but then my body started working better. Mentally, I felt better. I finally 
made the decisions that I needed to make to get to coach Kiri. And I'd been trying to get up here for eight years, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, my life 100% got so much better when I quit drinking, but it, it was a, it was a big problem. Like I, I had tried going sober a couple of times before that. Um, but I think it really did take that loss and just, I remember one night sitting in my house, I, I had an apartment by myself and I just had my puppy and a cat and I was like sitting, drinking a bowl of Jägermeister <laughs> <laughs> by myself. Yeah. Cause I used to convince myself, I was like, oh yeah, I'll just drink a bowl of tequila cause it has fiber. They say it's good for you. Oh, <laughs> it has fiber? Yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> you know what? I'll drink a bowl of vodka. It has no calories. I'll drink Jägermeister because it's a digestive, you, you know? You can like, start replacing that with uh, these legendary <laughs> yeah. tasty pastries. Oh, yeah. They got I mean, fiber in. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time I yeah, heard that shit. but Whoa. no but it's like it's crazy when you like it's Justify crazy it, yeah. yeah you can convince yourself of anything right oh, yeah. and then yeah there was one night where i don't know why i was sitting in my i was sitting in my apartment with my dog and my cat by myself drinking jägermeister in the dark and like filming videos for youtube and then i went back and watched them the next morning i'm like what is wrong with me like <laughs> there's a serious issue here. Like who sits in their house filming videos for YouTube wasted? And <laughs> they were just me rambling to my dog. Like it wasn't even anything. It just, yeah. That then sounds I, entertaining. Yeah, actually. I mean, I always had a good time, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I kind of realized after that, I was like, Oh, I don't think this is that healthy. And then I like, then, so I started trying to make decisions to like better my life. I was like, okay, I'm going to start going to coach with my, my strength coach at the time was Bo Sandoval at the UFC Performance Institute. Um, and he and his wife and his kid used to always go to this church in Vegas. So I was like, all right, I'm going to start going to church with them. And like the first time I tried to go, I was too hungover to get up and go. And I went, you know what? Like this is, this is a, this is a moment for me right now where I was actively trying to do something to better my life and my alcohol, my alcohol addiction stopped me from being able to do that. And it might seem like a small thing, but it was like the straw that broke the camel's back, you know? And then that's when I went, no, I'm done. I'm done. And I haven't, I relapsed at the end of 2020 for five weeks. Um, and outside of that, it's been smooth sailing. Yeah. yeah. How are you made aware of, uh, Kiri and Fitzgibbons and CSA? Um, so I remember, so I had a really bad injury back in 2012 and I remember at the, I couldn't train for like a year. And so my coach, Igor, back in Sydney, my gym, That Igor, sounds dope. <laughs> my coach, Igor. Mm-hmm. My coach, Igor. I actually had two coaches, Igor, Igor Breckenback and Igor Proporshikov. Well, that's me. <laughs> Igor Breckenback? <laughs> yeah. Know. His name's oh actually Igor Smil- Smiljevic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But he, his name is a uh, his stage name because he's a stuntman. Man, I'm already terrified of yeah. that. Never even met him. <laughs> he's five foot four. He's like a little. Oh, he's okay. a little Austrian dude with a ponytail. Um, but he's like, yeah. ponytail. Fuck ponytail you up. Ponytail's it. Yeah, he's like, he still yeah. fuck us up. <laughs> Steven Seagal style. <laughs> well, yep. he's he's done stunts with um, Jean Claude Van Damme with Jackie Chan. Cool. Yeah, like he's he's been around for a long time. Whoa. He's a stunt man. He owns his own stunt company. That's actually why his name is Eagle Breaking Back. That's his stage name because he broke his back doing stunts on a movie one time. We need to have a stunt man on the show. Oh, we need to have a few. That's yeah, amazing. That would be really if cool. he ever comes over, I'll bring him out. Yeah, that's, yeah. Good. Oh. that's why we got Melvin here today. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I remember I was like sitting. So when I got injured and I couldn't train, I was really depressed and then diving into my alcoholism. And then my coach, Eagle, was like, hey, why don't you come and clean the mats every day? So at least you're in the gym. So he like gave me a job. And I remember I was sitting on the mats one day after cleaning him and I was going through Facebook and I saw this like, highlight clip of Gina Carano and Kevin Ross and then it had coach Kirian and I was like oh my god like these people are amazing that's where I want to go and I set that I set that goal then I'm like okay whenever I can get to the US I want to go to combat sports academy and then I finally got to come out here um in 2016 my old manager flew me out I had a visa so he just got me a one-way ticket and I didn't know anyone in Vegas um but I just walked into a gym got a job at the gym was sleeping on someone's couch. You just have to walk like three hours to get to the gym every day. And I was like, my whole goal was, okay, I'm going to make the money to get to California. Like, that's where I want to go. I want to go to California. And it took me three years. And then I finally got brought out here with Hans from Monster Energy for one of Gaston's fights in San Jose. And so he took me into CSA and I met Kirian for the first time. And he held pads for me and yelled at me for fighting at 125 and said I needed to fight at 135. And I was like, okay, I really want to come train with you. And he's like, you're not fighting for me unless you go back to 135. And yeah, then that's kind of history. And we've had three major injuries and a lot of evolution and a couple of losses and a couple of wins, but 
I'm pretty happy with and where I am. And that's all the time we got. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, bye. Thanks, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Hans is always kicking drinks out of people's hands. What's the deal with that? That's his, that's his Why thing. Why is he always doing that, That's man? his thing, you know? Like... He has. That would be like, you know, someone, <laughs> like if I walk down the street and someone would kick out, you know, something out of my hand, I would be like, want to fight, like, but then I would be like, oh, he them? actually kicked with like really good form. I'm not going <laughs> to fucking touch that guy. That's what he does. That's yeah. like his thing. He's like, who you ever see these videos? No, mm-hmm. I haven't. So I'm actually quite curious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah see, uh, what's his uh, IG handle? Just Hans, Hans Mollenkamp, I think. M O L E N K A M P. There you go. It's spelled how it sounds. Um, but he does. That's his thing. He just walks up and kicks monster cans out of people's hands. And, Kicking the shit out of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But people love it. It's like his shtick. What do you think uh, separates out a coach? Like uh, <laughs> what is something that you noticed with Kirian that uh, – because he's like world-renowned. Yeah. He's one of the best in the world. As, as a striking coach, I think he's yep. world-renowned, right? So what do you think is something that separates him out from other coaches? Um, so something that I've experienced a lot is that a lot of coaches – like to tell you what they think you want to hear instead of what you need to hear. You know, there's a lot of yes men, particularly in my sport. There's a lot of yes men that will tell you what you want to hear so that they have an easier path to making money off you. Coach doesn't make any money off. Coach loses money. Coach won't even let me pay for his meals when we're in fight week. Coach loses money on every single one of his fighters. But the thing that I love about him the most and that I really think sets him into a in a league of his own is that he's always honest. Like he doesn't, he doesn't just tell you stuff because he thinks that you want to hear it. Like he generally wants to see us evolve as human beings, not just as athletes. And he, and he understands that if we're not happy with who we are as humans, we're never going to be great athletes anyway. And that really, the only other coach I've had like that is my coach Igor back in Australia, you know? So um, that was kind of the biggest thing I noticed. Aside from his like technical ability and his, his accolades within the sports, as a person like I know that I can go to him with any problem, with any issue, asking for advice, and he's always going to give me an honest opinion. He's never going to go like, oh, I think this is what she needs to hear right now, so I'm going to tell her that. He'll he'll be like, no, I'm going to black and white. It's just honest. Like he's called me out on so much of my shit, and I think that's made me a better person. Do you think there was a time as an athlete that you would not have been receptive to that? Because, you know, you hear about strength coaches for professional athletes and a lot of these coaches, they know that, okay, this athlete just doesn't like training this way. And if I tell them not to, they'll say, fuck you, I'm gonna find somebody else, right? Yeah. Would you, have you always been receptive to coaches that tell you how it is? Or have there been times where like, you just like, you were like, if this coach tells me that I'm done with them. Like you needed a coach to just kind of say baby you be a yes man be a yes man (laughs) honestly i've left coaches because i felt like they were yes men i felt like they weren't being honest with me Mm -hmm. um one thing i really pride myself on and i and i have for my entire life is just being honest about things and i want people to to treat me the same way you know so um i think that's why my journey within this sport has led me to so many different gyms and schools and coaches because i've been searching for someone like kirian you know for someone like my coach eagle back home just people who you know aren't just trying to make me happy you know because yeah. i don't need to whatever i can make myself happy i don't need my coach to make me happy i need my coach to tell me how to get better you know like I, i'm in this sport to be the best athlete that i can be and if you're just telling me things that are to make me happy how is that going to make me a better athlete you know mm-hmm. i want to know if i'm if i'm messing up like i want you to tell me hey jesse like you're messing up mm-hmm. do better that's that's what i respond the best to how do you lift for this sport because it's uh it's not an easy thing to figure out and people do many, many different ways of lifting. What do you think has been most effective for you that you've actually noticed with your punches or with uh, blocking someone from taking you down and feeling strong in the ring? Um, honestly, I love powerlifting. Like I, I powerlifted before I started fighting. Um, and when I was fighting at 125 pounds as opposed to 135 that I'm at right now, I couldn't power lift. I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to lift the way that I do because you know, some people just genetically, they put on muscle a little mm. easier than other people. And I'm one of those people. Um, yeah. And so I wasn't allowed to lift. And I felt the only times I ever got rocked in fights were at 125, mm. you know? And I really feel and like- Kyrian was right. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. I had no power and I was getting hurt a bunch. And it was the weight cuts and not being allowed to lift. And then when I went back up and could start powerlifting again, like I noticed like my grip was stronger, my chin was better, like mm-hmm. just everything. I'm I'm really little for my weight class. Like I'm short and I have short arms, but 
I think what I do have over a lot of people is physicality and strength, you know? So I love powerlifting. I am very upset whenever I don't get to do it, you know? Um, sorry. It is it is really one of my favorite things to do. Uh, do you end but, up training with uh, Jesse Burdick? I've done a little bit with him. You know what? Jesse and I... Jesse and I are on like these alternate pathways. <laughs> <laughs> I love Jesse. He's one of my favorite people. And we always talk about training together, but it's like then he's away, then I'm away, mm -hmm. then I start training with someone else. Or like you train he has with Amadeo and Novella quite a bit, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm with him three days a week. Um, so I love Amadeo. You know, he he we don't we don't power lift as much as what I would like to, but that's also me kind of trying to feed my own ego. You know oh, yeah. what I mean? I do a lot of single leg, single arm stuff, balance, stability mm. with Amadeo. And that's been a game changer in so many different areas. And I absolutely would not be doing that. I hate it so much. I'm sorry, Amadeo. <laughs> but there's like, it's so repetitive and boring. Um, but it's like translated so well into what I'm doing. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, ah, all right. All right. But yeah, I, I would love to train with Jesse. Jesse actually helps me with a lot of my rehab. He's made me cry more than anyone else by like making me, you know, those big, like heavy steel poles or whatever. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> he puts those on you and like rolls you out with it, right? Dude, kind it was thing. the, it was the worst thing I've ever experienced in my life was him doing my legs with, with those poles. You know why he does that? Cause he enjoys seeing women cry. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't we all though? It's kind of a nice sight. <laughs> Oh my god i think he Canceled. does <laughs> yeah, i think he is getting some pleasure out of it but i also th uh think that he just doesn't want to work on anybody so like whenever you ask him for advice he just kills you yeah even so if you, you don't ask come him, back even yeah. if you ask him like an exercise like hey my ankle's been clicking weird or something you know and he'll say you know hey do this this way but he'll give you like five thousand reps to do or something yeah. something crazy i think unless he, he likes like you, i'm not gonna ever ask him yeah. that again <laughs> i think unless he likes you because i feel like he likes me because he once gave me like an ankle massage so i think he likes me um that's kind of the drug deal i think yeah. the ankle massage was like you know <laughs> yeah. something to something like, to get you to come back like to apologize for how much pain <laughs> mm -hmm. he put me through every other time yeah i don't know why he does that to people he's mean he is so mean. He is so mean. I love Jesse though. Mega mind. He's got a big head, doesn't he? <laughs> like right here. I have his, no comment. <laughs> yeah, right. Right here is just like extra large, like a <laughs> pouch, battery he might, pack. He might wear two XL hats, but I don't know if that. Has but you have no the idea. His head. Yeah. The one size hats don't fit his <laughs> <No>. head. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> About your injuries, though, because you've mentioned you've had three major injuries. Yeah. In a lot of sport, a lot of athletes, when they get a major injury, it's like a, they usually just stop after that or they are never the same. So for you, what, what are those injuries that you've dealt with and how have you in your mind like dealt with that rehab? Because that shit's tough when your body doesn't move the way you want it to move. Oh, yeah. Especially when you're used to feeling really athletic. Yeah, yeah it sucks. Um, so the first one, I think it was the beginning of 2019. I said these have all been in the last three years. I had a Liz Frank fracture in my right foot. So I had three torn ligaments and five bone fractures. Was that in a um, fight? No, it was in training. I was getting ready for a fight and it was like extra credit round, right? Like I was done with my training. Oh. And then I was like, you know what? Like, yeah, there's this little Israeli boy. Like he's, he's really fun to work with. Yeah, we'll do one extra round. And then 10 seconds before the end of the round, destroyed my foot. So <laughs> I you was so thrown a kick or something like that? No, or? no, we were wrestling against the mm. cage. And he wrapped my leg up and took me down. And as I fell, my foot kind of buckled backwards underneath me. And it was like there was a there was a golf ball on top of my foot. And oh. I was in a I think I was on crutches for almost six months. Like I was in a cast on crutches for so long. Mm -hmm. Um and then the second one was I tore my ACL in a fight and then my elbow in a fight as well. But I don't know, like I don't know what else to do with my life. So like I like having a job to do, you know, and even if I can't actually do my sport right now, my job is to get healthy from this injury. And that in itself gives me a lot of freedom and a lot of solace. Um, it's more like the in-between fights when I'm healthy that I struggle with yeah. than actually the injuries. Like, yeah, it sucks. And I said, you know, after I, I before this last one, I'd said like, hey, I'm, I'm almost 35. I don't want to fight that much longer. If I have another major injury, that's probably me done, mm -hmm. you know? And then when this happened, I said to coach immediately, like my elbow had just popped back in. And I was like, I was like, coach, am I allowed to cuss? Yeah. yeah okay, sweet. <laughs> I've been holding it in. I don't know if you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, let it all out. I was like, coach, fuck this. I'm fucking done. And he's like, what? He wasn't even in the cage yet. And I'm like, nah, I'm fucking done. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, he's like, 
calm down, calm down. Like, let's, let's talk about this later. And I'm like, okay, went over and shook, shook the hand of the girl. I just fought and whatever. We left. I get in the ambulance. I'm like inconsolable crying. Like I couldn't even control. I couldn't even stop myself from crying. You know, I think a lot of it was shock as well. Um, as well as disappointment. And then we were in the ambulance. I'm like, fuck this. Let's go to Asia. I just want to fight Muay Thai. Jiu Jitsu sucks. And I was like, <laughs> I was like changing my entire career plan, you know? And he's like, he's like, okay, like, Whatever you want to do, we're going to do it. We're going to make it work. I support you, but I'm just going to suggest you wait till your emotions are a little lower and then before you make a decision. And then I was in the hospital for like three and a half, four hours. They gave me a ton of Percocet and I was like, all right, I'm cool. Like, let's go. I'll start training again, you know? So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's always hard. And in, in the moment, like in that moment, I didn't want to fight anymore. I'm like, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to go through this again. Like this has been three massive injuries in three years. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot. And I'm, I'm going to be 40 in a couple of years. Like I don't want to fight when I'm 40. I want to make the most of my athletic ability right now. And now I have to have another year off. Like yeah. that was, that was kind of what I was most disappointed about was just having to have another year off. Cause I feel like I've had, you know, in three years I've had nine months worth of being able to train and fight and the rest has been just rehab and rehab and rehab and that's frustrating but I don't know what else to do like I'm not ready to hang it up yet mm -hmm. um I think I still have a lot of fight in me and and once I kind of got over that initial shock and emotions and whatever I was like okay like now I got a job to do now you I can't can, uh dance like Kyrian I'm the worst dancer. Uh, I can moonwalk. I cannot. You dance. guys ever see him dance? No, I'm not seen him. He's a stud. Yeah, he he's does like break dancer. dancing and stuff. If yes. you go through her Instagram, there's like he's dancing with her and she's got like a sling on. I think, yeah, right? yeah. He was trying to teach me mm. how to moonwalk sideways and forwards. Yeah, and I was imitating him poorly. <laughs> I want to know though, because when we were talking a little bit ago, you were mentioning about the elbow. How when the armbar was pulled, you were tapping, and you know you, you see in fights that. They usually, you know, they usually wait for the ref to come yeah. before they stop. Now, was that a situation where you were tapping and it was apparent you were tapping or was it a situation where like she really just wanted to rock your elbow off? Uh, it, it was, it was a, a combination of everything. Combination like of everything. the ref took too long. Mm -hmm. She didn't, she didn't want to let go. She also said uh, in her, I guess a lot of people have been shit talking her because I saw that she put up an Instagram video where she was like explaining why she, why she kept going to break, you know, and whatever. But, um, apparently I haven't rewatched it. I really struggle to watch my losses, but oh, yeah. I haven't rewatched it, but apparently I tapped eight times before she finally let go. Like I remember tapping, I remember feeling my elbow dislocate, like felt it pop out and I went, Oh yeah, I'm done. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, yeah. And tapping. And then I felt everything tear mm. before she finally let it go. And then, uh, yeah. And my elbow was out. It was dislocated. Then I was sitting on my knees and I, and I was holding my arm and I flexed my hand and it went straight back in, which I'm grateful for. Cause I mm. think it would have been worse if it hadn't have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was kind of, I think that was kind of, like, I get it. She was probably going to get cut if she lost that fight. You know, yeah. her only way to beat me was with that. Like, I understand it sucks, but I understand. I'm going to fight her again. I'm going to knock her out next time. And then she's going to get cut. So <laughs> I'll, get, <laughs> oh. I'll get my payback. It's cool. Right. Wait, is that a known thing? Cause can you explain what you you just said? You flexed your your hand and then the elbow popped back in. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a thing. I've never had a dislocation. I just remember sitting on my knees and I was holding my arm like this and I went like that and I felt it. Go mm. back in because before that I was feeling my elbow and there was like a gap here. Oh, shit. But it's still very damaged. It's not like it's not like you're like, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not like in the movies. No. <laughs> yeah. No, I've only just been able to like pick stuff up and open yeah. my car door and I still like I can't like yeah. <laughs> Found it. Yeah, I had no idea, Kieran. He's very he's very <laughs> proud of himself for his dancing ability. He like gets in like a circle sometimes, right? Like and you guys uh, like kind of chant him on and he does all kinds like, of just floating. <laughs> That, that's actually very good footwork. Yeah, watch Jeez. as he gets going. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I, thought you did, I thought you did pretty good. I'm very, I'm I very white, that. guys. I'm very white. <laughs> like, I'm you sorry. said you were a gypsy. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I should be able to dance a little bit. I don't know. That's my assumption. I don't you know, know like anything about gypsies. Can dance? I have no nothing about gypsies. <laughs> <laughs> I really know this nothing about gypsies. Gypsy cannot dance. I think, no, you're, you're thinking belly dancer, and Zuma. I think that's what. Yeah. What is a gypsy? Gypsy, like a like a vagrant, I want to say, like, like someone that just like kinda a transient. Yeah. Don't have a don't, don't have, have like a, fixed a home address. Yeah. yeah, I have a PO box. That's my fixed address, mm. and I just 
like to go. I live in a trailer. I actually uh, am trying to build out a school bus so I can sell my trailer and have like a drivable. Wow. Are you like the outdoors type thing or is yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, I love it. I actually like my goal once I finish fighting, like I, I want to, I have a lot of things I want to do. I want to learn how to hunt. Like my dream is to have a, is to have my own TV show. That's about riding my motorbike to, to places to go out hunting. You know, that's like so oh, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, so I am trying to get into the outdoor industry. I actually just signed an agent, uh, like a marketing agency where they have a bunch of TV shows on the outdoor channel. So that's kind of the direction I'm trying to go in. I thought for a long time I was going to be on TV, but I thought I would act. And then as I'm getting older, I'm like, oh, I fucking hate acting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just want to be who I am, but like build cool stuff and go adventure outdoors and like mm -hmm. go live in Alaska for 40 days. Like I want to go do all that wilderness survival shit. Have you hunted before? I have not. I just got a bow. Uh, <laughs> so this, so getting my arm, getting my arm dislocated kind of like <laughs> fucked up a ton Gave of plans. Gave some time. No, it fucked up a bunch of plans that I had. Yeah. I was supposed to be going on my first hunt in, in November because I, I, I do stuff with Chad Mendes. Mm. So he has his uh, fins and feathers hunting, mm -hmm. hunting company. And so he got me my compound bow. We like, I've been, I've been practicing and then my goal was, okay, after this fight, I'm going to go back to Australia, see my family. I haven't seen my family in over three years. I'm going to go see my family, get my visa, come back, start, keep practicing, go to the boar farm, hunt some boar, and then go on this, go on this trip in November, right? And I can't even, I can't even pull my bow back right now. So fuck Julia. She, <laughs> <laughs> she ruined the rest of my year. Yeah. Did you, move, as, as a kid, did you move around a lot or yeah. like, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in a, like traveling around in a van with my mom and, and really? my brothers and sisters, yeah. We used to live on different, so they have these things. Uh, I think, I feel like they have them everywhere, but they're called rainbow gatherings. And so a rainbow gathering is where like the hippie community, there's, they pick like a plot of land or something and everyone congregates on that plot of land for a week or two. And then it's like, sorry, communal cookups, drum circles, like everyone kind of lives that's off the sick. land, contributes to the farm. So like, that's kind of how I grew up was in just on different, in different communities and different rainbow gatherings and living in teepees and tents and tops and vans and yeah. So I think that's where my fear of commitment comes from, uh, but also my love of being on the road. Yeah. yeah. People uh, expressing some kind of like freedom probably in some of that, right? Like yeah. they're probably, uh, I'm imagining, I have no idea, but people playing the guitar and like music and yeah. dance Everyone's and stuff naked. like that, right? A lot of nudity. Everyone's naked. <laughs> Everyone's naked. I remember my dad. My, so my parents divorced from when I was really young. Um, and when I was, I want to say I was like 10 or something. I don't know why my dad ended up coming to one of the, we lived on a place called Mary Farms. Um, and Mary Farms was an actual farm. They had like orchards and everything. So everyone would contribute to the farming and to keeping the land running. Yeah. Um, and he came up one time. I can't remember where, I can't remember why. And I remember he walked up to the main house and this woman walked up totally naked and she was beautiful like big breasts big butt beautiful woman and he was just like i don't know what i'm gonna do here <laughs> you know and he was like so blown away and then he got real mad that his kids were around a bunch of naked people and but like that was all we ever knew you know but it, it was yeah. that was the first time that i saw like an outsider come in and be like this is really weird because that was all i knew growing up was mm. being in different colonies and communities some nudist some not you know but it wasn't nudity wasn't a thing it wasn't taboo you know and then mm. i saw my dad come in and he was weirded out by it and then i was like oh maybe this is weird like maybe this is a strange place to be but yeah it what'd was your, what did your mom think of uh, fighting when you started getting into fighting? oh she was so sad <laughs> she was so sad how, and know, how old were you when you started 23 mm. yeah old um she she had these high hopes. Like I, like I did really well in school. You know, I had a scholarship to a private school, um, did really well in athletics and everything. And I think she had these high hopes that I was going to be the one who, who kind of changed the direction for our family. Like we grew up very, very poor. You know, my, my whole family, a few generations back, very poor. And so I think my mom, like I'd said, you know, I want to be a lawyer. And so then my mom had this, had this idea, like, yeah, Jesse's going to be the one to kind of change, mm. change the family fortune, you know? And then I started fighting and she knew there was no money in fighting. And she's like, I raised you guys to be nonviolent. And <laughs> she was so sad. And I had to explain to her, I had to explain to her like, hey, yeah, I love being violent in this arena. It is one of my favorite things about it. So, but when I fight, it's not about that. It's about, it's like a powerlifting meet. It's, it's like sport. a bodybuilding yeah. competition. It's like, was the preparation and the hours that I put in enough 
to help me win this. That's what it is. It's not the violent, the violence, you know, and the injuries is just, it's like an extra little sprinkle, but that's not the main, that's not the key part of it. The key part of it is my preparation, right? Am I technical enough? Like there's all these things. And it's once, almost the way that everybody else sees it, except yeah. for you guys that are actually doing exactly. it. You like, view it as a sport. Yeah, we see it as a sport, you know, and, and the outside world, the outside world, like what, the ones who love it, they want to see violence and they want to see blood and they want to see injuries, you know? And that was all my mom saw. And then once I kind of explained it to her, she's been to almost every fight. Oh, wow. Yeah, like she's yeah. been with me in South Korea. She's been with me in America. She's been with me in Moscow. Like she's traveled Singapore. That's she's traveled great. across the world for me up until COVID. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of one of the things that broke my heart about COVID is because she can't get vaccinated for health region reasons. And then I was like, Fuck, she's probably never going to be able to see me fight again, you know? But she up until then, she'd been with me for every single one. Like she went from being, oh my God, my baby, why are you doing this? To being my biggest supporter, you know? That's great. Yeah. So, <laughs> so quick question about like when you were a kid, living in those communities in mm -hmm. school, I, I guess, you know, in the United States, you know, people are just like, oh, you normal whatever go to school come back home what like did other kids know what your life was like or was the school within the community like how was that so i was just home, like when other people i was homeschooled homeschool. for a long time yeah okay. so i was homeschooled for a long time um i finally went to school when i was 10 or 11 because my mom sent me away to live with my grandma and my mm -hmm. grandma worked a full-time job so she sent me to school and I was such a weirdo. Like I, <laughs> I'd never been around kids before. Like I, I'd been around my little brothers and sisters, you know, and there were random kids in the communities, but I, I grew up with adults. So I went yeah. to school with a bunch of kids my own age being told what to do. I'd also never been told what to do, you know? Yeah. And I was lucky that I was very athletic and I was smart. So I, I always got good grades and everything, which kind of was the thing that I was able to throw myself into, but I, I struggled with the, I didn't have any friends for a long time. Like I was the weird, I was the weird hippie kid. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, like I, I had a bad boy baseball cap that I wore all the time. I was like the weird tomboy. Yeah. I was in like the popular group and we would be the Spice Girls and I was always the shit one. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was always Jerry. You know? <laughs> so so yeah. like I would be in the cool groups, but I would be like the outcast in the mm -hmm. cool groups. But it definitely, um, I definitely was always just the the weird, the weird loner. Like I never really cared because I'd never been around kids. I didn't know. I still even now, like I'm 34 and people be like, oh, you remember this show from when we were kids or remember this toy or this ad or this song? Mm, and I'm like, no, nah, I, know, I know none of that. Like, yeah. and that was always like, so I could never relate to people. I could never relate to kids on the things that kids relate on, which is like, oh my God, like the the TV show or this artist or anything. I was I would mm -hmm. just kind of follow along because I'm like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Oh, Jerry, sure. Like yeah. Spice Girls, what the fuck are the Spice Girls? You know? uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. When you said you uh, got into fighting at 23, uh, before that, have you been into fights before? I got into a fight in yeah, school so at, one yeah. time. Um, I got into a fight at school one time with a mentally handicapped boy that was two years older than me but i'm pretty sure he started it so i don't really <laughs> how, how'd he start it <laughs> i'm sorry how, how'd he start the fight <laughs> no 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 how'd he start the fight <laughs> fucked up <laughs> i know no believe me as a 34 year old woman i know it is as a 10 well, he was year, two years old as so. a 10 year old yeah and he was huge <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. He was extra strong too, I he bet. Was, he was very Careful. big. <laughs> I actually don't remember. I just remember the only thing I remember about it, because he ended up being a family friend for a long time. Okay. Uh, his name was Stevie Garner. He had and, to after the lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like he Stevie Stevie was like one of my mom's best friend's sons. Yeah. Um and I remember like as when he was an adult, my mom and him had these like CB radios and they would talk to each other like they were truckers on these CB radios. It was really it was very, very strange. Yeah. I don't remember why the fight started. All I remember is like grabbing him underneath my school. That's it. And then that was like the one time I'd be in a fight. When I manage nightclubs, um, I like throat jam someone down a flight of stairs one time. Woo! She was trying to make out with my boyfriend. So hey. I didn't hit her. I just like, <laughs> I just like shoved her, you know? Yeah, she just fell down like stairs. Yeah. <laughs> like a Sith Lord. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I think I liked, I think I liked the throat jam because I did that to another girl <laughs> one time. Uh, I was working behind the bar. Well, I wasn't working behind the bar. My staff were working behind the bar and yeah. I was, I was supervising, you know? And, um, she, this girl, so the nightclub that I ran, my brother and sister worked there for me. Uh -huh. And so my brother is a 
good looking dude, like six foot three, two forty. Like even even at this time, he was nineteen twenty, but he was like a stud, you know. And so this girl had been trying to hook up with him for ages. My brother's such a player. So I think he did, but he didn't want anything else to do with her. And so she came in and started talking shit to me about my brother. And I was like, oh, no, the fuck you don't, you know? <laughs> like, that's my baby brother. Uh -huh. And then she, like, reached over the bar to put her hand in the ice in the ice well. And I just went fucking nut, like, throat shoved her. And then she told everyone that I tried to fight her. And I was like, you'd be in hospital if I tried to fight you. Like, come yeah. on. Come on. They're the only physical altercations I've been in that I didn't get paid for, though. Okay. Did you know how to fight at all at that time? No, like, I think. Did you, like, box or anything? Or you know what I did? That stuff? I did four lessons of karate mm. as a teenager, and I hated it. Mm. Uh, but, I like, I played football in school. Like, I played, I did a lot of athletics. I power lifted for a long time. Um, so I was, like, always very big and physical. Not big. I'm not that big. But I was always strong and physical, you know, but I never – never threw a punch in my life yeah i still hadn't until i went to kickboxing like i didn't hit any is of kickboxing people. where you started is yeah. that the first thing that you did yeah yeah like i was trying to <laughs> i was powerlifting and i was getting ready to compete in powerlifting right my first competition i'd never done it before but i was like i remember reading the art an article in my local newspaper about this girl who was my size and i was like fuck her my lifts are way better than her because <laughs> yeah. i'm hyper competitive <laughs> And she just won like a state championship. And I was like, fuck that. I'm doing this, you know. But I had to lose a couple of pounds. And the guy I was dating at the time was a kickboxer. So he's like, oh, like, why don't you come to kickboxing? You know, it'll be a good workout. And I went and I remember like the first kick I threw, I was like, oh, my God. No, nah, I'm not doing like I'm not powerlifting anymore. This yeah. is it. Like I knew straight away that was that was it. Like best I ever felt was that first kickboxing class. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. so interesting. Like do you think it was uh, just like hitting the bag or something like that or – um, like what made me love it? Yeah. You know, I just find, find that part to be a, a really yeah. interesting. Like I, I never understood necessarily what it was about powerlifting that I liked so much. I mean, I guess I could say like the pressure, like the, you know, when you pick up a heavy weight, there's like a lot of pressure to it. Yeah. And there's a lot of things to try to figure out. Like, how yeah. am I going to manage my body with all this extra weight? Yeah. But I still don't really know what the fuck it was in particular that led me down that path. So yeah. it's interesting for, for you. Do you know, like, if there's anything particular, you got, like, feedback from um, doing certain movements or? You know, I there's something about fighting that gave me freedom, you know? It, it was like a form of self-expression that I never felt in any other arena, you know? And there's, like, very measurable and tangible goals that you can hit and accomplish and, like, kind of kind of see where you're at, mm -hmm. you know? And it just, I don't know, that very first day, like, up until then, like I was 23, I, I did a lot of drugs, drank a lot of alcohol, like I, I, whatever, like I was kind of just fucking around and I was feeling very lost and like I didn't know what I was going to do with my life because I tried going back to school, like I tried going to university to do sports marketing and I was around all these fucking 18 year old kids and I'm like, oh, these people suck. And I like did it for two months and went, nah, this isn't, it's not for me. I tried, I, I applied for the army, like I was just looking for direction. Mm -hmm. And then that first day, that first day kickboxing, it just, it was like something just opened up and I just felt like me for the very first time, you know? And that, that's been the thing that it's always provided for me is like, no matter what's going on in my life, no matter what I'm struggling with, if I'm having identity issues or if I feel lost or I don't know where I'm going, like I can, whoops, I can go, <clears throat> I can go to kickboxing, I can go to sparring and I know, I know who I am in those moments. Yeah. I think it's a really cool aspect of, uh, martial arts is the fact that it's uh probably the most direct uh in terms of like solving a potential yeah. issue that you're trying to deal with yeah. like people will try to lift you try to build up like an exterior like if i build myself up people will probably be less likely to mess with me yeah. or uh if i build myself up i'll just feel better about myself mm. but if you really know how to defend yourself and defend people around you uh, if there are situations that call for that yeah then you would know how to do so and i i think that when I was young, I used to kind of think like, oh, I'm going to lift heavy and I'm going to be good at football. And if anybody messes with me, I'll be able to take care of myself. Yeah. But I didn't understand. I didn't know because the UFC wasn't around and stuff like that. I didn't, I was unaware of like wrestling and grappling yeah. and jujitsu and stuff. As I got older, I was like, oh, that is probably where I should have went. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I probably should have went more that way. Yeah. Uh, but I just ended up doing what I, what I did.
Well, I mean, it clearly has worked out really well for you. <laughs> yeah, it feels good. I, I still enjoy lifting and everything. And I'm not a fighter, but yeah. when I was younger and I was a little angrier, I think it would have probably been something where I, I didn't get into fights anyway, but uh, it would have probably been something that, um, I don't know, just might have had some different results, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a good outlet, like um, especially wrestling and jiu-jitsu, it's so, especially for like – children on the spectrum or children that have anger or behavioral issues. Like it's, it really is such a, such a beautiful way to kind of create control and discipline and, and develop a sense of self-respect, you know, because like I said, like there's, there's ways to measure where you're at. There's like tangible goals that you can set and hit pretty much daily with martial arts, which it's is almost amazing. impossible not to be humble in that sport. Right? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's it. Like how many, <laughs> there's, there's, no matter how good you are, there's always someone better, you know? So you can never truly be that that confident, like, yeah, I'm the shit, because there's always going to be someone who's better at something, you know, whether they're faster, stronger, whether they have better vision, whether they're more athletic. Like, there's always someone that's going to humble you and remind you that, like, I still have a lot to learn. Yeah. You know, since you're around a lot of fighters, I'm pretty curious about this. Uh, do you think that since fighters fight so much in the ring and they spar and they're professional, I think some people think that fighters are just violent, are actually violent people. Um, but I don't think fighters are actually violent people inherently. I think that they have their sport, they have their practice, but out in life, they're not going to be the person who's going to actually be the one to blow a gasket and fight somebody. Yeah. Am I wrong in that? What, what, are you, what are your thoughts? You know, it's like there's yes and no in a lot of ways. Like I definitely know – some fighters I, okay i think once you get to a certain level within professional fighting it like creates a sense of calm like like you were saying like there's a there's a confidence that comes with knowing that you can handle it you know mm -hmm. it's also um, unfair in a way right like if totally. you really if you really know what you're doing i mean you could just yeah. you know someone is drunk and they start talking trash or they just have no idea like it's almost like you have a machine gun yeah right? yeah it's absolutely and then honestly like a lot of a lot of fighting in the street um comes from like having that fight or flight reaction, right? It's a fear response. A lot of it is a fear response. Mm -hmm. And so when you're around it all the time and you fight every day in the gym, you no longer have that fear response, which allows you to make conscious, educated decisions. Now, there are definitely people within my sport who would still make the conscious, educated decision to go and get into that fight. But yeah. the majority don't have that like, shit, I need to protect myself. They're more likely to try to defuse it and then like leave, you right. know? Mm -hmm. Um but at the amateur level, you know, when people are first getting into it, still there's, working things out. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of people who 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 start the sport as a way to like try to fuck people up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like as a way to give himself more ability to get into fights. I've met a lot of people who who are like learn how to fight in the gym so that they can go and fight in the street. Those people generally don't make a profession of it, though. So once you get to the professional level, majority of them will de-escalate and leave mm -hmm. situations. You won't really see them in fights unless they're the the crazy ones. Yeah. The professionals yeah. are like, let me get a paycheck for this if I'm gonna. <laughs> That's the other thing, right? right? Like, I'm only gonna fight if I'm getting paid to fight. You know, like <laughs> right. that shit's hard. Why? <laughs> Why would I do it for free? Yeah. How long were you a professional fighter before the uh, UFC called you up? Uh so I. Went pro straight away in 2012, and then I got signed at the end of 2017. So, like, five years. Okay. Yeah. What was that like, that whole experience getting called up from uh, UFC? Oh, man, it was wild. So, I was getting ready to – I was I was in the middle of a camp for an Invicta fight, and um, I got a phone call to say that someone had dropped out of UFC Sydney. I was living in Vegas. Someone dropped out of UFC Sydney, wow. which is, like, where, where my career started mm – -hmm. Um, and they needed an opponent for this other Australian girl who fought in the UFC. And I, I asked them to give me time to think about it. Cause I was like, fuck, like, yes, I want this opportunity, but I don't want to, I don't want to take it away from another Aussie girl. You know, there was only four or five in the UFC. So I'm like, that was my whole debate is like, yes, I want to do this, but I don't want to fight another Aussie. Cause there's hardly any of us here. Um, and then I said, yes. And then I beat her and she's a bitch. So whatever. <laughs> 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 to be fair, it was like that that particular fight was was a perfect storm. Was yeah. a perfect storm because on the regional scene back in Australia, like I I won all the Australian titles. Um she went she started fighting in the US before I did. 
but there was always this like storyline like Jess needs to fight Jesse needs to fight Beck like that was always since we started it was like these two need to fight and we were two division two weight classes apart I was 135 she was 115 mm. and they but that was like through the Australian MMA scene it was like we were the two that needed to fight each other, you know? So then when I got the call up to fight her at 125 in UFC Sydney in front of my, in front of like my hometown. Yeah. Um, that was kind of like, it was, it was like a perfect storm, you know? Mm. Like it, it was, it was the end of this storyline that had been five years in the making. Uh, her and I weren't really friends. Like we were kind of not enemies, but just not cool. Like, I remember I was getting ready for a title fight and I had to do like an in-cage presentation and she was drunk in the crowd and like shit talking me while mm. I was up in the cage. And so there was like a lot, of, there was a lot of stuff leading up to this. Yeah. Um, but like the weird thing is that six months before that happened, her and I actually kind of became friends because we like, I just went through a domestic violence situation and she came out of a, of a marriage that had that. So we kind of connected over that, you know, and she, helped me get through mine um, and then I ended up fighting her. So it was like, there was a lot, there was a lot mm. kind of culminated in that, in that moment. But fuck, that was like the best moment of my life. Like, well, I, I, I dreamt for so long of, of being like in front of my friends and family and seeing my name up here mm. and walking into that cage. And yeah. I remember like, I'm in tears as I'm walking out. I was just so happy. Mm -hmm. And I walk out and I see my best friend and my mom and my sister, like everyone's there in the walkway as I come out. And then, yeah, then I won. And then that kind of, it was good because she was shit talking to me all week too. Uh -huh. So like, it was just, yeah, it was just everything about that was, was perfect. And no moment has matched that fight up until this last one where my arm got broken. Mm. And even though I lost that, like that walkout, that walkout was like, whew, fuck, it was like, I know why I was addicted to alcohol for so long because like that was the feeling that I was chasing, you know? Yeah. Mm. And I think that's why people get addicted to this sport because there's these like random little nuggets where you're just forever just chasing it, chasing it, chasing it. Yeah, that was the one. This website blows. Okay, here we go. It was just the announcing the uh, the winner of the fight. She was so bad. Have you too. ever had... Um, <clears throat> Have you ever had the emotions of the crowd uh, sway what you're doing or like even just somebody just, I don't know, maybe your opponent's uh, frustrating you with certain moves that they're doing. Like you ever have it like make you mad to the point where it kind of messes you up or crowd reaction to something that the person's doing, but they're not even really doing <laughs> anything that spectacular. Like have you ever had that shift your emotions around? I haven't. And I think the only reason I haven't is because I'm a, I'm a very happy fighter and I feel like the moments when you see fighters get swayed by the crowd or get swayed by their emo uh, by their opponent is when they're like overly emotional and they have a lot of anger going into a fight, you know, because then that makes you hyper reactive. But I think because I always go into fights really happy, it's very hard to shake my energy, mm. you know? Um, and, and honestly, when I fight, I don't even hear the crowd. Like I hear nothing but my coach and her coach. Like that's that's pretty much it. And that 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 came from my coach Eagle back in Sydney because I had one kickboxing <laughs> I had this one kickboxing fight with him and I was one hundred percent brought in to lose this fight. Like it was at the Serbian club. I was fighting a Serbian girl. I got in the ring with no I didn't they didn't even turn the lights on for my walkout. Like I'd walked out in the dark and got in the ring. <laughs> And then I turn around and there's like this slideshow of her and these lights and music. And I was like, oh, fuck, I'm about to, like, I'm about to die, you know? <laughs> and then my coach, Igor, he said to me, he's like, he's like, don't worry, just see her and hear my voice. That's it. And ever since he said that to me, that's all, that's all that happens when I fight. Like I've had 20 fights since then, you know, and that's it. I see my opponent and I hear my coach and nothing else. I don't even hear the crowd. Sometimes I don't even hear my other coaches because I can only hear like my main coach, which kind of sucks. But You sometimes forget a little bit of what you're doing and then you might hear a cue from your coach that maybe calms you down, gets you back, back um, on track a bit. Like maybe you go out of your game plan a bit or something like that. No, you know what? But no, but something I did have, I did experience recently, not this last fight, the one before, which I, I also lost is like my brain just went blank mm. you know like i like i don't remember that fight like all i remember is i remember feeling real good i felt fucking great and i came out and i threw two inside left kicks and i remember nothing nothing after that i didn't get hit 
did like it was like my it was like fog of war like my brain just blacked mm. out um and i went and i went straight to natural instinct and because the fight before that i wrestled a bunch so i went straight to wrestling mm -hmm. which gave her because she was a judo black belt like at a at a like world class mm. judo black belt and yeah. so i put myself into her strength you know um and that that kind of that's the only time that i haven't been on my game was that and i've done a lot of mental work since then to try to like figure out why that happened how i push through it if it happens again like even rewatching the fight it doesn't come back i haven't rewatched it, you <laughs> haven't it? Re no i haven't okay. rewatched it you know um i do struggle to watch my losses yeah because like i always have so much disappointment around it that it's it's hard for me to put myself back to, to like willingly feel that disappointment again and i know that that's that's a weakness and i do need to I do need to work through that and I need to be able to watch my losses because that's how I'm going to get better and learn from it. But um, see if we can pull them up right now. Just <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm, out. Right I'm leaving. <laughs> Fuck you, Coach Kiri. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> nah, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's easy to get distracted when you walk out and all those lights are on, you yeah. know? But it's uh, that this is, and this is, I think, the hardest thing about our sport. Like, all technical aside, like fighting people aside, whatever, you want to get one shot. That's it. Like, you never get that chance back. It's not like a game of football where you have 80 minutes or whatever to play. And if you like fuck up one play, you can come back from it. It's like you make one mistake in mm. my sport and that's it. You're done. You're done. And, and especially being in the UFC, like, that one mistake could be the difference between you having a job and not having a job the next day. Like, which, which kind of makes it really hard. And then, me being foreign as well and not being a resident out here or a, a US citizen yet is that if I lose my job, I lose my visa, which means I lose my ability to live here as well. So there's always a lot of pressure that I think, I actually think that led to that me blacking out was I just, I, I was so focused on like all these things that could happen if I lost that it almost feels like I created it, you know? Does it make a difference that CSA has uh, so many talented uh, female athletes? Like, cause I know some gyms, uh, have predominantly more like men and yeah. the girls sometimes will spar with the guys <clears throat> and so forth. But is it more motivating or how, is it different in any way just to have, cause Kyrian has a, a lot of female athletes that are yeah. really kicking ass, right? That was a big appeal of going to CSA, honestly, cause I'd never, I'd never really had female training partners up until going there. Um, we were actually just talking about this before where like there's, I've always trained with men and, and there's, there's things that training with dudes, um, it brings to the table, you know, but they never fight you. Like there's no, there's a different level of intention there. And so when you, when you're with a woman, when you're sparring with a woman, when you're grappling with a woman, like they're going to fucking fight you, you know, it does, and, and <laughs> that's the only thing that's realistic to a fight. Like I, like I could grapple, I could do jujitsu with a dude or spar with a dude that's my size and get beat up, you know, but it's like, they're not trying to hurt me feels way different when someone's genuinely trying to hurt you and you only get that from women. So I definitely think having female training partners was something that I missed for a very long time. And when I finally found it, I was like, yes, this is this is a key, key point for me. Um, and then we, we just had a bunch of girls leave, uh, like stop fighting, you know, so I lost a lot of female training partners and my, I've been searching for women to train with again, you know. And then I do train with a couple of the girls at Team Alpha Male, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but that was it. Like having these women that were there when I first went to CSA to train with and then losing them, I noticed such a big difference in my training. Like I just wasn't getting the same, I wasn't getting to fight. Like it's hard to emulate the feeling and the pressure of being in an actual fight if you haven't fought through camp, you know? Was there somebody there that maybe motivated you where you came in like first day and you're like, I would love to be like that. That's pretty Yeah, sick. Zoila Frausto. Yeah, I she's pretty impressive. Yeah, dude, like... <laughs> yeah. She was, I'd been watching her for a while before I went out there. And, and when I finally got to go there, I was like, fuck yes, I get to train with Zoila. She beat the <laughs> shit out of me for so long. Like for the first year that I was there, I just felt like I was constant. I felt like I sucked and I was already in the UFC. And I'm like, how the fuck am I even in the UFC? Like this, I'm the worst fighter in the history of the world. Like <laughs> this sucks, you know, but she was just that good. And then, but that, when I said like, you can measure your progress with this sport. That was who I measured my progress against, you know, like the day, oh, I can defend now, you know, like, oh, I'm not getting hit as much. Oh, I can see if she's kicking and I can defend it instead of eating it. You know, that was, that was how I measured, <clears throat> excuse me, that was how I measured getting better, you know? So when, 
when she stopped, because she's not fighting anymore, you know, she she went on to a different career path. And when she stopped training with us, like I definitely noticed, I definitely noticed the difference, you know. I hadn't been able to train with her for a bit before she left because that was right when I hurt my knee. Um, but man, I loved, I loved kickboxing with her. She was, she's so great. She's so great. How do you guys control sparring intensity when it comes to striking and fighting? Just because it's like with jujitsu, sparring is easy. You can spar at 100% in jujitsu and yeah. nobody could get hurt. But when it comes to like kicking, punching, et cetera, how do you guys keep that in check so you don't fuck each other up too much before you actually have to go into the ring? Or do you just fuck each other up? I mean, it depends on who you're training with. Yeah. <laughs> um, Why are you laughing get, so much? What's coming to mind right now? Probably get yelled at by Kieran a lot, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I was just laughing because I actually, I'm, I'm teaching a bunch of like very green people, guys and girls, how to fight right now. They all have their very first fight in nine weeks. So I'm like... I'm just teaching people how to how to do that, how to fight each other without fighting each other. And like what we always say is you have free reign to the legs and body. Like hit the legs and the body as hard as you want. No one's gonna die from you leg kicking them super hard, you know? Um, but we keep we keep head contact pretty light. Like yeah. we really do. So one thing that I that I really love about CSA and Kyrian is that he he always um he wants us to go like high intensity but low power to the head, you know? So we all learn how to be very fast and how to put combos together, but not give that like last little Just bit of impact. Draw back a pinch. Yeah, yeah. Until a uh, couple weeks out from a fight, then I choose my training partners and then we kind of try to fuck each other up a little bit, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's a mutual agreement. That's the thing. Like in general sparring, we keep it very light and technical to the head. Uh, but like I definitely have training partners that I know, like if I want to have a fight round, we can have a fight run, but we talk about it before. Like I don't just go in there and go, you go really light and then I'm going to try and knock you out. <laughs> there are definitely people who do that. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> it's it's funny because jujitsu sparring obviously is not like fight sparring, but it's, it's it's hilarious when like you're like, let's flow roll. And they're like, let's flow roll. And then they just go crazy. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, that's. I'm definitely not one of those people in jujitsu. <laughs> I would imagine it would happen a lot if, uh, if somebody's not as good, right? Like they, they're because they're just like I. Yeah. I need to just fucking do whatever I can. That's, yeah. To survive here, so then they try to. Yeah. They just do, turn do, it to a hundred real quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they probably start to do kind of like dirty shit. Yeah. That like's not great for practice. Or they don't. Or they don't realize they don't know how to control it. Is is what it is. Like I never spar with beginners. Unless it's like no head contact, because it's just it's too risky, honestly. Because yeah, they say like the white belt can hurt you the most, right? Totally. Because they just. Because they, they don't know where the stopping yeah. point is. They even don't know how to control stuff. their own body. They don't know where to oh. stop. Like, they just... Well, even a couple of things I learned, I was like, I have someone in a hold. And they're like, yeah, yeah just do Kill. this. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I didn't even know. Because you don't even know. You know nothing yeah. at that point. And you're like, I didn't even realize I had yeah. an arm bar. And that's what it is. Like, you you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's it. But yeah, yeah I, I, I don't even really roll with white belts, honestly, just because... I feel like I'm hyper injury prone lately. So I try to mitigate that by not training with people who don't know what they're doing. Mm. Cause it definitely is. It definitely is a risk. Mm -hmm. Power project family. How's it going now on this podcast? Mark, Andrew and I, we talk about fasting a lot. We talk about the ketogenic diet and a lot of different types of diets, but Bub's Naturals has a product. They have the collagen protein, which is amazing. They have these apple cider vinegar gummies, which are like crack. But they have <laughs> they are these yeah. They have these MCT oil powder packets that ah, I've never used to do this. But in the morning, I'll wake up and I'll put it in coffee. And the smoothness, number one, in terms of the mixing, is amazing. But the consistency of my energy through the day because of the MCT oil powder is peak, Andrew. Mm. How's your experience? With that? Yeah, no, it's, it's exactly it. It's like the best way to start the day. Uh, you're satiated, you're energized, and you're just ready to crush the day. Uh, so if you guys want to get in on this MC2 oil powder, head over to bubsnaturals.com and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Again, Bubs Naturals promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. With, let me ask this, because you mentioned how like fighting was something that helped you out with alcohol before. And it's, it's something that keeps you going. Like even right now that you're rehabbing, yeah. like you, you have your focus on your rehab to your next fight. To knock uh, someone out. To knock someone yeah. out. Yeah. Have you thought about like what fighting looks like when you're not focused on fighting in the ring or what like, Maybe. as in like, you know, when your career does end somewhere down the line, have you thought about what, you know, what else you want to do? Cause I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're still going to have some type of training within that training and fighting, mm. but 
it might not be, you might not be doing it in the ring anymore. Have you thought about what that looks like? Yeah, I, I ha you know, I, I go through waves because there's like, there's a big part of me that hates MMA training where I'm like, fuck, like I'm so beat up and I'm so sore. Like wrestling's hard, man. Like I love wrestling, but it's so hard on your body. So honestly, like there are days in camp where I'm like, fuck this. After this fight, I'm done. Like I'm not doing this anymore. This sucks. But um, yeah, I'm definitely not at that stage. I think once I finish competing, I know once I finish fighting MMA, I'm going to be on a journey to win a Muay Thai world title. I know that. Okay. I definitely, that's definitely something I want to accomplish before I retire from competition. Um, I think I will always compete in something though. I have this idea that once I stop getting drug tests, I'll take a bunch of steroids and do like strongman competitions, but really? Uh, yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was just <laughs> wow. have you back on the show. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. I, I just, I, I like, I like being strong, you know, and I like to compete. And I think I'll, I definitely know once I finish fighting, I'm going to have to find something to compete in. I don't entirely know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard. I, I like. I think I'll always do kickboxing because that's my first love. You know, I I probably won't do jujitsu. I'm not one of those people who's going to be on like a journey to get their black belt once they finish fighting. Like, once I'm not fighting anymore, I am not doing jujitsu anymore. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm out. Sorry, I guys. would encourage you Sorry, to uh, you know keep keep athleticism. You know, like For if, sure. if you are going to lift heavy, uh, you know, hit the bag here and there. Just yeah. get some like rotational stuff. We've talked about it before that like when when you are lifting in the gym. Uh, the athletic stuff is not really addressed yeah. typically in like regular lifts. And so uh, having some sort of exercise or some sort of thing that you do that has reaction time yeah, uh, and then something that you do that has like some sort of rotation and just different movement. Yeah. Because even, even, uh, even with the heavy lifts, if you look at like some of the greats, they still can move really well, or at least they did move really well during their career. Like Brian Shaw comes to mind. Yeah, like yeah. Brian Shaw was like, he moved great. Like he would, he would set up for like a deadlift. His, uh, his shoulders would be like down by his knees when he, <laughs> his legs would be straight and you'd be like, Oh my God, like that's incredible yeah. mobility for a guy that's six, eight and 440 pounds. Wow. <laughs> so you want to try to keep the athleticism, I think as much as you can. So that way you're not too stuck together. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I like, I like to think of myself as an amateur doomsday prepper. Like I'm always, I have a bunch of videos on my Instagram of like running in Converse and stuff like that. Cause I'm like, when the zombies come, like uh -huh. the shoes I'm putting on is a pair of Converse. So I need <laughs> to be able to escape. Um, so I do like, I want to do like training for life. You, you know, like, like a zombie apocalypse uh, bus. Is what dude, you mean, for real. Right? I mean, well, yeah. You get like the roll cage on I'm it. I'm absolutely and, like, have not, it just... not planning that with my school bus <laughs> at all. Um, I did try to figure out how to get both of my dogs on my motorbike so that we could, <laughs> so that we could dip when yeah. the zombies come. Um, but I, I do, I am a big fan of like training for life. You know, like I, I follow a lot of people. I have a lot of friends who just train to be mobile and athletic. Like, I never want there to be a day where I couldn't run away if I needed to. Like that that's kind of one of my biggest fears and that was what I that was what I realized with the with the foot injury and the knee injury how like vulnerable I felt, you know, cuz I'm like fuck like if something happens I can't help myself and I can't help anyone else and I never want to feel that way again. So yeah. I think once I finish fighting like I definitely I really want to get into trail running. That's that's something that I really want to get good at. I I love I'm such a big fan of Cameron Haynes. Like I love, I love that he is a proponent of having athleticism for bow hunting. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I want to do. You know, like I, I want to, I, I want to go do like endurance races and I want to, I want to go do survival, like survival shows and stuff like that. I just want to be capable for life, you know? So I say like, yeah, I want to take a bunch of steroids and do strongman. I still want to do that, but I'm going to be able to, to run a hundred miles at the same time. Whoo, whoa. Not a like hundred miles. I'm so full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I like where your, I like where your head's at though. I think that makes a lot of sense. Like have, have, uh, uh, something that you, you have to show yeah. what your training's, you know, what your training's doing for you. Yeah. You have a competition to go to. Well, I need to have goals. Yeah. Like I'm more, I, I, that's what I was saying earlier, like what I struggle with outside of fights is just not having anything to do, not having right. anything to work for, not having a schedule. And that's why I'm not that upset when I'm injured because I have, I have things that I need to accomplish. You know, Trail I have running goals. something you can get into now. 
Well, you know what, Amadeo and I, I I've said that to Amadeo a couple of times, and then <laughs> what is up with Amadeo? He's like yeah, keeping you from know. doing all these great things. I don't know. God damn it, Amadeo! No, I don't know. You've been I, trying to get on the podcast for a couple of years. Yeah. And he's been trying to keep you down from that. <laughs> We've been talking about coming in a train. Yeah, I don't know. I love that guy. He he's so busy. He's he's one of the busiest people I think he's I've incredible. ever met. Like he's he manages so many different fighters, plus like a bunch of public public students, plus his kid, like. Yeah, he's all over the place. So I don't. I never fault him when he says we're going to do something and it just doesn't happen because I understand life happens. Um, but I actually have a friend who, uh, his name's Dan. He lives in Montana. Who is a runner and he's like been trying to help me get into running because I'm such a terrible runner. Like I'm built for short distance. I'm not built for long distance, and I'm trying to get better at it. But it's it's hard. Like I would rather go and fight than <laughs> go for a long distance run, you know, but he keeps telling me that trail running is easier than flat running because you have so many different vari like so many variables. You and know? that makes it easier. Well, cause it's not like <laughs> flat running. You're just the same thing Yeah, that's the true. whole time, you know, like trail running, you have up, you have down, you like have you views. have flat, you have views. Like there's so much other stuff going on and mm. I need stimulation. Like I can't, that's my excuse for not flat running is right. I'm like, Oh, so fucking boring. <laughs> It can be. It could be really boring, and it is a little bit more taxing on your body because you, uh, when you go, when you go up a hill, it just automatically slows you down. Yeah, you know. So, you, but then you have to run downhill. Yeah, which kind of can fuck you. Or up. Or you too. try to push uphill and then you slow yeah. downhill because right. I don't want to fuck up my knees either. So that's right. kind of what I'm like. Oh, yeah. A lot of coordination and stuff too. A lot of balance. A lot of yeah. stuff with the ankles, like trying to position yourself on like rocks and yeah. different things. Yeah. It's actually, re it's great, but yeah, you, you can still fuck yourself up pretty easily. Well, that's also why I haven't really been pushing yeah. to go and do it because I also feel like I'm out, I feel like I'm quite uncoordinated and uh, <laughs> clumsy outside of my sport. So like, I really want to learn how to skateboard. I have a skateboard at home, never been on it because it's I'm- not, Get a longboard. A longboard will, like, it'll get you ready for that skateboard. Trust me. Why, why'd you, why'd you sign? What's up? What's up? What's on Should your I mind? Should I go get some rollerblades? Should I just do rollerblades instead? <laughs> no offense to no. anyone who rollerblades. No surfing, huh? Nah. Oh, dude, sharks. Nah. <laughs> I have a, I have, I have another friend in LA, Alexa, who keeps like, she messages me probably once every two weeks. Like, when are you coming to LA so I can teach you how to surf? Teach me how to kickbox. I'll teach you how to surf. I'm like, bro, like, sharks, man. It's <laughs> nah, not going to go well. Nah, nah. But it's, uh, it's so stupid. I don't want to surf because there's sharks, but I was just talking to one of my friends about doing a trip to Hawaii to go swim with sharks. So I'm like, but that's like <laughs> controlled, right? Like I'm, right. I'm making the decision to be around sharks. And, and you're I'm like in a cage, right? When no, you do the swim the no, no, no. Thing? So, no, no, no. So, in Hawaii, there's this group that I follow. I think they're in, in Oahu and they do guided swims with uh, tiger sharks and they have like behavioral specialists that swim with you and know. Fuck off. There's <laughs> no. <laughs> you want to do that? Okay. So, wait. So, wait, was, whoa. You like just wait, like wait, just swim. Yes, you just like chilling with sharks. Yeah. Sharks like cool. Yeah. And you're just But then there's people who like work with the sharks all the time where like if it starts getting a little frisky, then they go up and redirect it. It's so and cool. you'll put your, you'll just, you know, put your just life in their hands chill. like that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, wait. So I had this conversation with my friend the other day and I was like, we were like, yeah, let's <laughs> let's go to Hawaii. I'm like, let's go to Hawaii. I want to go swim with these sharks. And he's like in a cage, right? I said, nah, free, like free swimming. And he's like, fuck that. I want to go do great whites in a, in a cage. No way. And then, so I started watching, there you go. So then I started watching cave, like cave, uh, cage diving with great whites where the great whites are attacking the cage. I'm like, why would you rather do that than do this? Look but, how like, peaceful just, this is. That you're going to show me someone getting attacked right now. No, no, no. <laughs> like, I just, uh, no, those are the sharks that are nice to everybody. They're different kind of sharks. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, so the 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 one that I want to go swim with, they have tiger sharks. Oh, fuck, dude. I, I don't know. You, know, so you think that's worse than being in a cage with a great white? That sounds no, terrible. Think, have you seen I, okay. I think it's all bad. Have you seen 47 <laughs> Meters Down? Have you seen that, that movie? Is that the one with uh, the Franco it. guy? With Mandy Moore. No, okay. <laughs> I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't even do a uh, virtual reality. Wait, was it actually with Mandy Moore? Is that a joke? <laughs> it is? <laughs> okay, I haven't <laughs> seen it. <laughs> oh, it was so funny. I'm just, <laughs> when is I, Mandy Moore? I haven't seen her in a movie in She's a in long a movie time. called 47 Meters Down where they're in Mexico. I think it's Mexico. And they go... Uh, shark watching in uh -huh. a cage and then the thing breaks and then they get stuck at the bottom and they will get fucked up and die. They get oh. eaten by sharks. So no, I'm going in a cage. 
Sharks aren't really that dangerous. It's propaganda from the news. Oh, you reckon? Mm, yeah. And, and, and birds are real. They're robots. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I've, heard of, this, I've heard of this shark swimming thing from six other people in my life. And there's one through line that is the same with every single one of them. They're all, like, they're all white. <laughs> and, and, and every single time I have this conversation with them, I'm like, why? Why? There's a girl that I knew that she, she, she's very similar. And she's just like, you know, I just want to be able to go out there and flow. And they have people that'll walk you through it. And you swim with the sharks. I'm just like, dog, y'all. Dude, I don't even want to be in there with like a fucking stingray or a jellyfish. No. No. Uh -oh. I'm less such a, shark. a pussy, bro. Yeah. Wait, stingrays and jellyfish are terrible. Stingray killed Steve Irwin. Yeah. And have you ever been yeah. sunk by a jellyfish? I haven't either, but it looks like it sucks. It yeah. looks terrible. Very painful. Yeah. There are oh, jellyfish man. in Australia that will kill you if they sting you. Mm. Oh, oh, shit. Box jellyfish? Yeah. Yeah, Irukandji? Yep. Yeah, Australia don't fuck around with Australia animals. has a lot of yeah. just really wild, like those oh, spiders yeah. that you guys got down there. Have you ever dealt with any of that? Like the big ones? Yeah, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, huntsmen. So, uh, okay, so wait, 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 wait. So Americans, Americans have this idea. It's like, <laughs> it's like, okay, story time about my mom. I've been to Outback Steakhouse. I know. <laughs> you know exactly. Yeah. You know, Blue Monogian. Yeah, see. You should see the first time I took my granddad to Outback Steakhouse, he was so angry. Oh, He's like, great. this isn't anything like home. What the fuck is a blue monogian? Like, granddad, I told you. And you get a shrimp and it's like this big, right? Yeah, we have, we have prawns, yeah, like big prawns. prawns. Yeah. No, so the other day I was I was, I was at the Red Hot Chili Peppers concert in San Diego and I sent a video hey. to yeah, yeah, and I sent a video to my mom. Um, Cause I grew up, that's who I grew up listening to, right? Mm -hmm. My very first boyfriend looked just like Anthony Kiedis when mm -hmm. he had long hair and I fucking loved him. So I sent mom a video and she's like, oh my God, I wish I was there. I'm going to come back to the, I'm going to come back to the States. I said, cool. I have a friend, my friend, Dan, the runner in Montana. I'm like, he has a yurt that's an Airbnb in the middle of the forest in Montana. Why don't, when you come out, why don't we go up there? There's like uh, waterfalls and stuff near it. We can go hiking and blah, blah, blah. She's like, no, there are bears. And so that, so her saying no, there are bears automatically is like you guys with dangerous mm -hmm. animals in Australia, where you just automatically assume that no matter where you are, there's all Huntsman these dangerous, spider. yeah, there's just fucking <laughs> spiders and sharks and crocodiles. Like, <laughs> no, you guys are probably not going to see any of those things. Well, we're, we're no also, kangaroos, not just hopping around. You'll see, can, you'll see kangaroos around the city, like on the outskirts of the city. That was supposed to be you'll a see joke. More I didn't no, <laughs> you'll, see, you'll see wallabies everywhere. Wow. But okay. like, you go to Sydney City, you might see a snake one time. Like okay. you, you won't. You'll see daddy long leg spiders. Like you're not going to see any of the really dangerous stuff. Um, you'll see sharks. There's definitely sharks on the beaches in Sydney, but uh, where I'm from, <laughs> there's everything. Absolutely everything. Like the big spiders, snakes, crocodiles, sharks. Everything. Yeah, Australia is fucking gigantic too. Yeah, it is, and that's the other thing people don't realize is how big Australia. I think is. it's like the same size as the US, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah but every, wait, what? True, but every map and globe hmm. is made by Aren't the U.S. and then they put in this mm -hmm. tiny little thing down the bottom. Wait, us, no, pause. Australia is about the same I, size I, as the United States. I think so. It's I mean, like, when I, I can Google this shit. When I on. flew there, I went to, uh, <gasps> I landed in Sydney and I was there for like two days. I I did like a powerlifting seminar thing there, and then uh, this was like ten years ago. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm flying somewhere the next day. And then I just never looked at my ticket. I never thought about it. I got on the flight and they're like, you, you got a six forever. hour <laughs> flight to, to, uh, <laughs> to Perth. Yeah. And I was like, what? I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm like, are we like flying all over the fucking place? Wherever I look at the map, it's just straight across. And yeah. I'm like, oh shit. So Australia yeah, is huge. United States is 1.3 times bigger <gasps> than Australia, but. That's Australia is bigger. about 11 times bigger than Texas. So oh, there you it, go. in my head, I'm like, yeah, it's probably as big as Texas. I had no fucking clue. Yeah, no, it's um, big. Yeah. And On I the always, map, it looks smaller than Texas. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what I'm saying because most maps and globes are made by the U.S. So then you guys are like, fuck Australia. U.S. is the biggest country in the world. But to be fair, we get them from China, so well, it's really their fault. Yeah, China obviously <laughs> likes the U.S. more than they like Australia. <laughs> but sure, I, wait, like, I, I gauge everything in how long it takes me to drive there because I drive mm. everywhere. And so I was looking at that the other day, like how long does it take me to drive from like west to east coast of the U.S. and how long does it take me to drive from west to east coast of Australia? Mm. And it's very similar. It's like only a few hours difference. Yeah. 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 Australia went crazy town with uh, COVID, right? Oh my God. Mm. They like had like internment camps. They wouldn't like literally yeah. wouldn't let people like leave their house and no, stuff, right? Couldn't leave your house. Uh, people that were flying in literally got sent to these camps, um, forced vaccinations. Like, Forced vaccinations? Mm -hmm. Forced vaccinations. They mean? had forced vaccinations of children. Yeah. Like it was wild. My my mom didn't leave where she was. Like my mom kind of lives in the in the bush a little bit, you mm -hmm. know? So she mm -hmm. just 
kind of stayed secluded where right. she was. It wasn't like that everywhere, but a lot of like Victoria, the Bigger state areas. was 100% locked down. You couldn't cross borders. Like we thought we had it bad here. You could still go to other states. Yeah, in Australia, yeah. like you couldn't cross a border. Holy yeah, you couldn't fly in, couldn't fly out. Like, and you were here at that time. I or was were you here. Back? Okay, no, no, okay, I was okay. here. I haven't been home. I haven't been home since like 2019. I think. Okay, yeah, okay. I was supposed to be home right now, and then that chick I fought kind of fucked up all my plans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is she? Do you think she might be one of your next fights? Because I know you probably one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like my uh my plans so are the not the last girl I fought, the one before the judo black belt who armbarred me the first time. She's about to fight another girl who's been training with us at CSA. So I'm kind of hoping that she loses because then I can call her out and try to get her first, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get redemption on that, win a couple, then I'll fight this last one. That's my plan. Let's go. Yeah. How many fights have you had in the UFC? Eight. Oh, wow. Yeah. Eight. It should be a lot more, but all my mm -hmm. injuries have been since I've been in the UFC. Mm. <clears throat> when you first started... Uh, in MMA, uh, the UFC didn't have women fighting probably, right? Or was that uh, just happening I around think the same I time? Started, I think I started right when Ronda fought mm. in the UFC. I think I might have been training for like a couple of years before she fought mm. in the UFC. Yeah, it's so, changed so much. And uh, I remember Dana White kind of had that statement. He's like, he was like never no be, women. Yeah. yeah, there'll never be women yeah. in the UFC. And now... People like crave it. Now people yeah. are like, holy fuck, the chicks when they fight, they're just going all out. Yeah. Well, I think I think women always we always feel like we have a point to prove, mm. you know, because like we're always battling um acceptance, I think. Because there's still a lot of people who are like women shouldn't be fighting. There's still a ton of male UFC fighters who are like women shouldn't be fighting, you know? So it feels like every time we fight, it's not just against ourselves and the person we're fighting. It's like against that that generalized idea that women shouldn't be doing this in a male sport. So mm. I think I think that has a lot to do with why we fight so much harder, you know, because it's mm. it's not as accepted yet, which is wild. It's 2022. <laughs> like right. it makes no sense. Yeah. It's, it is interesting because <coughs> we were we were kind of having this conversation the other day. Even at my jujitsu school, there's a few women, right? There's maybe about 15% of the school's women. And that's yep. probably how it is in all schools. Yeah. But when it comes to fighting, like for men, it's a normal thing. Like not normal, but it's not, it's not weird if you see a guy going and fighting in public with another yeah. guy. It's like, yo, right? But even when you see a woman go into a boxing school or jujitsu school, it's like there's, it made me think there's a special type of, I guess, courage it takes to be a woman and then go into one of those schools where you are the minority and train. Because yeah. it's like most of your training partners are going to be dudes. Yeah. You'll have a few women to train with. And sometimes you'll have no women to train with. And yeah. you're only training with men. Yeah. And it's like there's there's something a little bit different that you have to you have to really want it if you make that choice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But it's such a like fighting is such a primal instinct, yeah. right? Like fighting, fucking, feeding. Mm -hmm. Like the, the three most primal instincts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but people generally don't see women as having, like women aren't supposed to have fighting or fucking as, as their primal instincts. You mm. know, women are supposed to be nurturing and maternal and taking care of things while, while the man's out doing all that traditionally. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think a lot of people don't realize that we all have that instinct. Like, True. like think about how many mothers would, would give their lives to protect their kids. Like it's the same instinct, mm -hmm. right? It's just, we've chosen this outlet to to release it. That's the only difference. Yeah. And I think um, when I first started, like there weren't that many women doing it, you know? And then as more of us kind of came on the scene and especially like in, in the public arena, mm -hmm. it's become more acceptable and it's not as taboo as what it was. And so it still does make me sad when I see gyms that only have one or two women, you know, but yeah. it's becoming so widely accepted now, which is amazing that it's not like, we're not the outliers like mm -hmm. we used to be, you know? And even like I still, there there have been women fighting way longer than I have that had, that had it way tougher than I did. Like they were beating stereotypes every single day. They were like fighting for their for their right to be in this sport. I haven't had to do that. Like they, they did that for me. Um, but yeah, it's like, I think people are starting to understand that fighting is part of being a woman. Like we have to fight for so many different things, you know, whether it's like, 
acceptance, whether it's in a gym, whether it's fighting for our kids, whether it's fighting for our family, like we've had to do it our entire lives. Like it's, it's just, I have the benefit of having a, a physical way to express all the fighting I had to do leading up to fighting kickboxing. Yeah. yeah. Well, on a good woman, I think will ground a man a lot of times, Yeah. you know, a lot of times, a, a kind of, uh, I guess like bring the guy back down to earth, you know, yeah. uh, tame, tame the beast, if you will. Yeah. And I think a way for a woman to be able to be that is, is for them to have confidence, you know, and that's one really cool thing about like jujitsu, boxing, all these different things is that it, it gives these women a sense of confidence that they might not necessarily find anywhere else because there's something so powerful. I mean, I get, ma okay. I get made fun of all the time because I road trip all the time. And whenever I have to stop for fuel in the middle of the night, I always try to call someone, right. And be like, Hey, just be on the phone with me while I'm stopping at this gas station yeah. in, at 3am, you know, because you can't really trust any anyone. And my mm. friends make fun of me for that. But I'm like, I'm being safe. Like the day I don't do that and I get murdered in the middle of Montana, like you guys are going to be like, oh, why wasn't she more careful, you know? Um, but there's <laughs> there's <damn>. like, <laughs> but there's like, so, so as a woman, we always have those fears, right? Like we're yeah. always smaller. We're always physiologically weaker. That's not sexist. It's just a, it's a legitimate thing. Genetically, like, we don't have some of the physical advantages that men do, you know? So we're, we're always having to be on edge in certain respects. And so there's some fighting, learning how to defend yourself, doing jujitsu wrestling, you know, having strength, being confident with being hit, with hitting someone else mm -hmm. really does bring like an extra level of, of, um, assuredness, you know, an extra level of confidence to being a woman. And I, I wish more women would do it. I think, I think there's still like this stigma of like, oh my God, like chicks can't be violent, but it's not oh, that. It's can. just, oh, they definitely can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like the, the positive things that learning how to defend yourself brings to your life is, is there's nothing that really compares to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you must mentioned earlier being in a domestic, uh, relationship, domestic yep. violence relationship. Uh, how did that happen? And like, uh, if you don't mind me asking, um, interesting like if you're a fighter then yeah I, yeah but I, I don't know i guess i'm uh you're not you're not weak you know you would be you i would think you'd be strong enough to be able to but i don't, I don't know for sure well he he was a fighter as well okay. you know um mm. but there was you know I, like i was with him for a few years we were engaged um he there was because we trained together a lot there was like a lot of lines that were blurred you know, mm, so we sparred together a lot. We grappled together a lot. We were both professional fighters. Like there was definitely, there was definitely no boundaries when it came to it being sport and it being at home. Um, it's just like, I knew, I knew what those boundaries were. He, ne he didn't necessarily know, mm. you know? Um, but I think because I, because I was a fighter, it almost, it almost like, gave him a little more freedom to cross that line, mm. if that makes sense. And I can't say that like I 100% fought back. Absolutely. Like I'm not going to, like um, I'm not going to not defend myself, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that was actually that, that event is actually what led me to moving to the U S you know? So I don't, if that hadn't have happened, um, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now, you know? So like, I don't even really harbor any resentment towards him. I still hear from him every now and then. Like he still messages me on Instagram when I fight and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. it took me a long time to like be okay with having communication with him because of everything that happened when we were together. Um, but I've also realized that like everything has a purpose. And though those events in that relationship, um, I can't say I, I, I can't say I was 100% innocent in those moments, you know, that, that was when I was a bad alcoholic, I absolutely instigated some of our I incidents. Like I know that, you yeah. know, um, he knows that I know that I'm, I'm very honest about that. He just took it too far, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, do you think it started maybe with, uh, more like verbal almost at first and then, yeah, you know, he, uh, cause like with training, I mean, you could like, if he's coaching you, then he can, you know, tell you that you fucking suck at it or could maybe put you down because he maybe he's thinking that's like a coaching cue or something like that. Well, he he wasn't he wasn't my coach. I was a much oh, okay, I was okay. a much better fighter than him. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I was I was like I was 
I was better than what he was, you know. Yeah. Um, we were very similar in size. He uh, was a little, he was a lot thicker, but we were like same height and everything. So we were training partners for each other a lot. Um, and they're definitely like I cannot train with anyone that I'm dating. Like it's not, it's it's just there's too much emotion there. Like someone's going to take it personally, and that that was kind of what that relationship mm. taught me is that like yeah, mm. there are some lines that just can't be crossed. Like like work is work, personal life is personal life. You know. Um, but it definitely like, I think if we hadn't have both been fighters and those lines hadn't been so blurred because we were training partners, it probably wouldn't have gone the way that it did, you know, but I honestly am grateful for that because that, that is such an integral part of my journey and my story. And the reason why I'm standing here in this room with you guys today, because if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have felt the need to escape and I wouldn't have moved to the U S by myself, you know? So that, yeah. that really was like the event that kind of set everything in motion. So that's why I don't have any anger or resentment or, or really any negative feelings towards it because that was what led me. Like I love my life now and that's what led me to be here in this moment. Mm -hmm. Plus I'm doing way better than he is. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Like, do you find that, um, since like since you have fought and you are a fighter like when it does come to being out like later on when it does come to like being in relationships do you have more control over like your emotions and stuff do things are you good at de-escalating or do you find that like is there any aspect of the fighting that makes relationships any any harder uh yes to everything um <laughs> yes, to everything. okay <laughs> there there are definitely there are definitely issues with being a female fighter and trying to be in a relationship with someone, right? Because like if I date if I date another fighter, a lot of the a lot of the guys that I've dated a lot, I'm talking like there's been tons. <laughs> there hasn't. <laughs> but like the couple of guys that I've dated who've also fought, I've been at a higher level mm. um, and had like a like a stronger following, all that sort of stuff. So there's there there's I think when you're both in the same industry, there's a little bit of competition there. And especially being the woman who's doing a little bit better. I've just been doing it for longer. That's all it was, was that I was more experienced. I've been doing it for longer. Um, but it, it does create like an unnecessary tension, you yeah. know, because there is still like the male-female dynamics, you know. So when your woman's in a male-dominated sport and she's doing better than you at that thing, especially when that thing is fighting, which is inherently a masculine uh, aspect of life, I think it's it's hard. Yeah. On the on the other side of that, dating someone outside of the industry, um, in my experience, it's been really hard for them to be okay with me training with the dudes that I train with. You know, uh. because like, it's like fighters generally look a certain way, right? Most of them have six packs and like good athletic shape. You know, like physically, they tend to look very similar. Um, and that's not necessarily what I'm attracted to, but the guys that I've dated outside of the industry haven't understood that. Haven't understood that like, if I'm doing jujitsu with a guy, I don't see it as a guy. I see it as a training tool. Like it's not, it's not man versus woman or like I'm training with a girl or I'm training with a guy. It's just, that's a training tool, you know? So that's, that's kind of an issue when it comes to dating people outside this world. I don't know what the success, what the successful recipe is. I'm very single. Um, <laughs> but in terms of like the lessons that I've learned from fighting and carrying them into relationships, since I've been sober, I think I'm a lot better at uh, handling conflict than mm -hmm. what I was. Like, like now I have the ability, now I, I, I kind of understand my shortcomings, right? Um, I don't, I used to be very angry as I, as I progressed in fighting. I'm just, I'm just not angry anymore. You yeah. know, like I'm, I'm generally pretty passive. Like I don't really like conflict. I don't like confrontation. Like I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to tell you what I think. And if you choose to escalate that into something, then that's on you. That's mm -hmm. not on me. Like I'm not hurtful. I know I'm a good person. I know I'm nice. Like I don't say anything to try to upset people or hurt yeah, people. Yeah. I just say, I just say what, what's true for me, you know? Um, and I do think that that's come from fighting because you can't in fighting, like you can't lie. I have this tattoo and it says one true thing. And that's about fighting because it's like when you get locked in a cage or you step in a ring, like you're, you're stripped bare. Every, all the preparation that you did is laid out on the table. Like who you are in those moments is laid out on the table. You can't lie or hide anything, you know? And, and 
willingly put, putting myself in that situation, experiencing that has enabled me to be that way in my personal life. Might not be working for me, but <laughs> yeah. But I, I definitely like, before I went sober, I definitely used to like get into arguments a lot uh, more than yeah. what I do now. Yeah. Yeah. You got any TV shows that you're into or anything? You mentioned oh, when you were office. young, you didn't watch much, but. I just watched The Office. How many times do you watch you. it? <laughs> Dude. <laughs> 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 uh, okay yeah so, <laughs> okay I I I have this is no exaggeration I've watched it every single night for at least the last seven years of my life Jesus every night it's a comfort show it is I watch it to go to sleep like yeah. that's it I know I can't I don't even have to watch it I just listen to it I know exactly what's <laughs> happening there's no stress it's so calm and happy um, but I'm watching I'm watching Criminal Minds right now which I love I love Criminal Minds and I'm so addicted to it. Wait, what's Criminal Minds about? Criminals? Uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, criminal, criminals, but like, is it like a doc, is it a docu-series? Is it a show no, with no, characters? No, no, it's a series, it's a series, but it's about uh, the BAU, the Behavioral Anal Analysis Unit, they hunt serial killers. So Why do y'all love that shit? It's a white people thing. No, it's not a white people thing, it's a <laughs> woman thing. Woman, yeah. thing. <laughs> woman loves serial killers. Like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, even, Every single one. Not know. everyone, it's, but no, like a it's lot. True. It's very true. Why is it for you? Why is it? Uh, mm -hmm. You know what? I mean, I got to kill some people to get some attention around me. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck's going on? I don't know. I feel like there's something so interesting about like learning about the mindset of a serial killer, you know, because it's so, one, it confirmed that I'm definitely not capable of any of that. Um, but too, like, like when I said people laugh at me when I call people in the middle of the night when I'm on my road trips. Why like, do you watch all that? Shit? A lot of that's because I, and that's what that's what they say. Like, oh, you listen to too many serial killer podcasts. You watch too many serial killer shows. And I'm like, yeah, you're gonna keep saying that until I get fucking murdered. <laughs> and then you're like, why didn't she pay more attention? Like, so y'all are just trying to be more careful. Y'all are trying, trying to understand trying to what the fuck's going on here. I don't enjoy it at all. Oh, you do. Oh, for sure. Hey, yeah. wait, every, <laughs> every single episode of Criminal Minds has like this severe crisis and then it gets resolved and everything is happy at the end. Like what's not to enjoy about that? That's true. Yeah. It's just like a love story with people getting murdered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It is interesting how most of those stories are so similar. You know, the background of the – I, I kind of like some of that stuff too. I, th I, like, the, uh, I like the background story yeah. of – any like whether someone's like a hero or whether someone's completely demented, I kind of like hearing that story. It, I do have a hard time when it comes to anything with like kids. I don't For like listening. Yeah, I don't like that either. Any of that <clears throat> shit. I forget what the series is I'm watching right now, but there's some shit with like a young kid, young kids in it. I'm like, oh, I don't think. Yeah, it's horrible. I don't think I can continue the series, and I'm already a couple episodes in, yeah. so I'm like, now what do I do? Euphoria. <laughs> um, no, it's um. Oh, okay. It's you on. Watch you for it. I finished that shit. It was good. <laughs> I haven't watched it. Yeah, watch. You gotta. Nah. Why not? Why? Why'd you give me that weird? <laughs> you watch it. Why? Why was that? It's a good show. Because everyone I know who watches is a woman. <laughs> Zendaya killed that shit. Zendaya killed that shit. If you guys haven't watched Euphoria, watch it. It's it's a. Uh, it's it's well done. The show I'm watching is on Apple Plus. What is it called? Oh man, I need to get Apple Plus. It's really, really. I don't have Apple Plus. What what yeah. do you use? Uh, right now I'm on Paramount. Okay. I just got Paramount. There's watch the offer. Things. What's the offer? The offer. What's it about? Okay, have you have you ever seen The Godfather? No. Okay, well, okay, so The Godfather was one of the top grossing movies of all time. It's yeah, like number 29 on the total list. Anyway, it's about the making of The Godfather. What's the whole list? The whole, I don't know, all 29 <laughs> movies? <laughs> <laughs> but I know the, the Godfather, like at that time, when it was made, it was like literally the, it, it grossed the most out of it before any movie or more than any movie at that point. Yeah. So it's like, it's still historic. So then what's the offer? The offer, okay, so The Godfather started off as a book by okay. Mario Puzo, right? You and know a lot about The Godfather. Because I watched The, the Offer. <laughs> and you know the fucked up thing? I haven't even seen The Godfather. I'm going to get flamed for that shit. Because <laughs> it's like I watched a movie about the making of The Godfather. And it's one of those movies that everyone's like, I can't believe you didn't watch it. I'm like, I'm sorry. that guy. I haven't even seen Scarface. Yeah, I, haven't watched it. I haven't seen Scarface. Oh, that's really good, though. Yeah, I've yeah that one's really good. I haven't I've watched heard. Karate Kid. I haven't watched Rocky. Well, you, oh, you, you got to watch Rocky. You, you were born in Australia. You know what? That's why I don't watch it because everyone goes, oh my God, you got to watch that. Oh, and I go, nah, so fuck good. you. I'm not watching it. <laughs> haven't watched Breaking Bad. Fuck Me Breaking neither. Bad. <laughs> haven't watched Sons of Anarchy. Fuck Sons of Anarchy. I haven't seen Sons of Anarchy either. Okay. The show I'm watching is called Blackbird. 
Blackbird. Blackbird. Bird. It's fucking awesome. Well, so was that the one, the kids one? That, that's yeah, fucked yeah. There's up? some weird fucked up mm. shit with kids in there, but you're not selling it well. It's dope. <laughs> <laughs> it's dope. It's a it's a prison movie. Oh, I oh. like prison movies. Yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. it's pretty sick so far. <laughs> like sick, like cool, or sick? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. awesome. Okay. Someone it's demented good. on someone's like, watch the offer if you have Paramount Plus. Okay, it's, so it, Blackbird you'll... and the offer. Yeah. I can do that. I'm I'm only four seasons left at Criminal Minds, so. I'm sure we'll be finished that by next week. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I've done nothing, that shit before. I got nothing to do. I've I got done nothing that shit to do. Before. When are you able to uh, like get back into full training? <sighs> I hope. I hope I can grapple next month is what I'm aiming for. Tried doing a push-up yesterday. Hurt like a bitch. So mm. that's kind of going to be my indicator. When I can do a push-up mm -hmm. and like be able to extend, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try grappling. It's hard to extend the arm all the way. Yeah, like I'm, I'm here and that's pretty painful. And then with like rotating, I'm fine. But that way I can't. Punch Andrew for a second. Let's see. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I, we, at least. She took it seriously for a second because <laughs> yeah, I saw her like, look at him like this. At least <laughs> till, at least till we finish the show. And then, you know, if I you know get knocked out, like I, at least we did the show. I wouldn't hit you in the face. Where would you hit me? I mean, not in the face. Liver? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Liver punch. Damn, Could you be, imagine I'm that? Pee blood? Have you ever been hit in the liver? Uh, yeah, but like just fucking around with like just friends, but oh, I never not hit? not by a fighter. Fuck no. It sucks. It's the what is that sensation like? What do you it? want to feel? It? <laughs> I mean, we can make it happen. <laughs> do it, do it. I would make a okay. Hell last of a video. last time I got dropped, <laughs> so many <laughs> TikTok <laughs> views, dude. Last time I got dropped uh, was by Cody Garbrandt, and I was trying, I was oh. trying to kill him. Like oh. I was trying to kill him. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was like, fucking wild. I love Cody. Cody's one of my friends, but uh -huh. I was like, fuck yeah, we want to train with him forever. Like we got the spa, so I was trying to knock him out, and he perfectly placed his toes. On oh. my liver, holy mm. shit. That was one of the worst things I've experienced. This immediately training. makes you feel sick. Like I couldn't even breathe. I was like, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. I was on the I was on my hands and knees. I'm going, <laughs> and Coach Kieran's like, get the fuck up. He's like yelling at me, get off the ground. Cause he refused he's like, if any of my fighters ever get hurt, ever get finished or like lose a fight because of a body shot, you're out of the gym. Yeah. So he's like, team. Yeah. So he makes us like, if we, if we get hit to the body, he's like, get up. You got to keep going. Yeah. He's, he's done that to me with a couple of injuries where he's like, eh, you're fine. Keep going. And then yeah. I like go to the doctor later. They're like, oh yeah, everything's broken. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Thanks coach. <laughs> oh. Makes you tough though. And now I pass that on to my students and I blame it on coach if they complain about it. Some so of those body shots, it it's like a delayed response. It is. It takes, yeah. it takes a couple seconds. Yeah. Like you, and then you're, you're like, going, oh, oh, I'm not good. Yeah. You're like, ah, cool. I'm fine. Then you go to do something that's like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. it sucks. What's the worst place to get hit? Honestly, that. Yeah. For me, yeah, that liver. I mean, terrible. Terrible. I've been hit there a couple of times in a, in fights, and I'm like, never, psh, whatever. No one even knows, but I've definitely felt it. Mm. I've I've gone to like I've gone to coach after and be like, fuck, did you see that? That was the worst. And he's like, nah, what happened? I'm like, yes, covered it up. <laughs> no one's gonna know when it happened. Yeah. Yeah. So does it just hurt it like once it happens and then you just like, eh? or do you feel it the residual lasts. effects? It, or it depends, and it it really doesn't take much. For mm -hmm. it to be bad, but it's like a it's like a lingering thing. It's like it like starts and then it crescendos and then it just like stays mm. up there. It sucks. You it's guys so uh, train your feet in some way, or is it mainly just because like you're barefoot a lot for your training that your toes and stuff get strong? Because you mentioned Cody Garbrandt hitting you with his toes. But he, like, he like got his toe up yeah. underneath my rib cage. It probably helps <laughs> like, if your toes are kind of <laughs> strong, right? Yeah, uh, I think we all have broken our feet so many times mm. that it's like calcified so and that's a common thing that happens oh yeah oh yeah yeah like Breaking i've, toes I've broken my feet toes so many times like you kick elbows like mm. yeah kick knees um we also we have a shin conditioning bag which <laughs> it's like so we have this bag that hangs up right it's a four foot a shin conditioning yeah. bag that sounds so horrible it's a four foot bag the bottom half a foot is like concrete it's it's so hard so like we start higher and then you and then you condition your shins and you work your way down. <laughs> I had my students do it yesterday and I was like, all right, aim for this point. Like I told them where to aim. I might do this. One of my guys, yeah, kicked all right legs perfectly, hit the spot, turns around, 
throws the <clears throat> hardest left kick right at the bottom of the pad, dropped him like a sack of shit. <laughs> I'm dying laughing. I'm like, you fucking idiot. But it's so bad. It's like kicking a concrete pole. You should but, feel numb at this point. Like, like when you touch your shins, does it have this? Do you remember what sensation feels like? Yeah. There? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, it's taken a long time <laughs> to get to like a lot of the tires. They, they don't feel anything like the, uh, the nerves are just, they can just smash a wall. With yeah. Their, their nerves are just, they've just done it for so long that their nerves are dead. Like there's no, their, their shins. Like I've seen x-rays of like a regular person's shin where like bones are hollow inside. Right. And then, you see someone who has done shin conditioning mm. and it's just broken and calcified so many times that it's just solid. It's just a wow. solid piece. So um, I actually only noticed recently, I think in my last camp, like I blasted someone in the elbow and I was like, oh, that didn't even hurt. Like, like it's like I didn't, I didn't gradually notice how oh, it's getting better and better. It's just like one day I kicked someone full force in the elbow and hit like the top of my foot on it and I went, oh. Yeah, I'm cool. Like, let's keep going, wow. you know? Whereas only a few months before, I did the exact same thing and I couldn't walk for two days. So it's like, mm -hmm. you definitely build it up. I can still feel everything, but it's like, it's just not as debilitating. Yeah. It'd be really interesting to see you under a DEXA scan. Right. See any of those people under, yeah, see what their bone density is like They're, in those areas. Shin and shin <laughs> it's just like <laughs> white. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. The ties for sure. Yeah. Well, the jump rope, kicking, kicking poles, kicking trees, kicking pads. Mm -hmm. Who are some of your favorites? Fighters. Yeah. Masato. Do you know who Masato is? No, I don't. So Masato was a was a Japanese kickboxer, and his style was like power boxing and heavy leg kicks. He's See if we can so bring up some beautiful. Clips of him. My my coach Eagle used to train with him. He used to be one of his. I said I was going to marry him. I fucking love <laughs> Masato. Uh, how do you spell his, How do you spell the name? M A S A T O. Very handsome Japanese man. Uh, doesn't <laughs> <laughs> doesn't fight anymore. Um, Super good looking. So Ooh, good looking. Now I'm curious. Dude, <laughs> he is. He's a handsome dude. Uh, but stud, like absolute stud. Just power boxing and leg kicks with my favorite style. Um, Liam, Liam Harrison, who's an Englishman who fights for One FC right now, exactly oh, the yeah, same. Yeah. Power is. boxing, heavy leg kicks. Uh, but yeah, I'm my own favorite fighter. But they're two fighters that I try to emulate that mm -hmm. I would love to fight like. Mm. like power boxing, heavy leg kicks. My dream finish is to break someone's leg with kicks. Mm. How <laughs> is, uh, I'll oh, put, you, put wow. you on the spot here. Well, we'll, we'll watch this guy for a minute here. Oh, I love, I love his freaking. Uh, he was quite his... tan in that first one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pulled up the Google images of him and I'm just like, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah, he's so, he was so good. He was so good. Looks very technical, huh? Yeah, just a stud. Like, quick, quick question, because I'm I am naive and unaware. When it comes to kickboxing, what are like the the rule sets versus something like MMA? Obviously, kickboxing, you're not grappling, yeah. but you're punching and kicking. Is there anything else specific that fighters like they need to be careful of, or they're not able to do? Yeah, well, so there's, there's different styles of kickboxing. So there's like kickboxing K1, Muay Thai, mm -hmm. um, European kickboxing. Like there's a lot of different styles. Basic kickboxing is just punches and kicks, okay. right? Um, I think K1, K1 is punches, kicks, long knees. I don't, there's like, they have clinch rules. So you can't knee in normal kickboxing. I can't remember. Okay. Don't, don't quote me on that. Gotcha. I know I know that uh, Muay Thai is everything. Muay Thai is clinch, elbows, knees, sweeps. Um, there are styles where you can't clinch or you ha or you can only clinch for like 10 seconds and you have to break. There are mm -hmm. styles where you can't sweep. There are styles where you can't elbow. Like kickboxing has no elbows. I don't know if it has knees or not. Don't don't quote me on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like so Muay Thai is the art of eight limbs. And that means like fist, elbow, these kicks on both sides is eight weapons, right? Um, out of eight weapons, sorry. And then a lot of the other styles take some of those weapons away. But Muay Thai is like is like MMA of striking. Like oh, you can wow. do everything involved with striking. Yeah, yeah. How is Andrew Tate? Do you know, are you aware of his <laughs> career at all? I don't know who that is. No, you don't. <laughs> He's like a famous YouTuber guy, but uh, he used to be a. Once you type his to, name in on YouTube, all your recommendations. He used to do kickboxing and stuff like that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know who that is. is uh, I'm, I'm also really bad with names. Is Kevin still fighting? I don't think so. I don't think it was such a, such a mm. shame because he's so brilliant. He's so amazing. Mm. Um, he's inspiring to just mm. to anybody that's ever watched him fight. I think, yeah, you know? he's incredible. Like he, yeah, he he uh, 
he he was my favorite fighter for a very long time. He's also so handsome, which helps. But uh, he's a stud. Like he's just such. I love just savage, like gritty, dirty fighters. Mm-hmm. My favorite. He had a he had a <clears throat> one video that he posted where he just like ran on a treadmill. It was like after a fight. It's like the next day. Yeah. He went to the gym and I think he lost and he just. He just went all out on the treadmill. He's like, this is what I need. You know, he yeah. just went for it. And I just thought that video was so inspiring. I'm like, this is this is sick. Like, this is this is what the great people do, you know, to get better from uh, their yeah. loss. Oh, yeah, he does that shit all the time. It's yeah. so good. He's Who is so this good. person? This is Kevin Ross. Oh, Kevin Ross. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So he, he, uh, he was with my coach for a very long time. He's, he's the first one that I ever saw from my gym was oh. Kevin Ross. Wow. When he puts everybody down like that, it uh, it's so degrading. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, he <laughs> has look at them. he has like a demeanor to him, like fuck you. Like, yeah, that's exactly you're, it. You're going on your back. That's why yeah. he's the soul assassin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jesus. love that guy. Yeah, no, he's, he's amazing. cool as fuck too. But that uh, that like that like going like going all out of the tournament. Like when I was talking about, a lot of us just try to outwork our demons. Like that. That's mm. it. You know. It's hard to sit there and, and deal with your loss and figure out mentally and emotionally like why things happen the way it happened. It's easy to go and just outwork the way you feel, you know, mm-hmm. but eventually it's going to catch up and you have to deal with it. Mm. How do you pull yourself back then? Like, what do you do first off as far as recovery stuff since you train so much? But when you are on that, oh, you laughed. Okay, so you don't do shit? <laughs> 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 I just had this conversation with coach yesterday and I was like, hey coach, when I come back to training, like I got to figure out my schedule more. I said, because I'm not my twenties anymore. Like I can't, I don't recover the way I used to, you know, mm. like I need to, I remember being in my twenties and partying all night and going and doing four <laughs> sessions and being fine. You know, I used to smoke cigarettes. Like I was like, yeah, fuck, let's go. Now, Damn. now I fought, now I go to sleep at 1030 instead of 930 and I'm Hey, <laughs> yeah, I'm a rat. high five! Yeah. <laughs> shit, <laughs> Woo. Doing the same an shit. Mess. So I, 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 uh, I'm not that great at recovery, but I am. Uh-huh. I am making a conscious effort to prioritize. That what was the second part of your question. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's the recovery thing, but then, um, damn, coming I, back after a loss. He, was it coming back Wasn't after it? a loss? No. No. I mean, that sounded like where he I was going. I thought that's where right. he was going. But yeah, I thought that's where he was going. What too. about your sleep and stuff like that? You sleep okay, or is that shitty? Uh, it's something I'm working on. I, I've, uh, notoriously, I think from years of working in nightclubs and cause I, I've always had two or three jobs and mm-hmm. tried to train around them. So, mm-hmm. um, for, for like, fuck, for probably from when I was like 17 to 30, honestly, I would survive on two, three hours every night and it would be broken. Like it would be between, between work or between training sessions. Um, so I'm still a little bit in that habit, but I, I can't. I can't handle it the way I used to. Mm-hmm. So I really try to make a conscious effort like to be asleep by 10, you know, cause I'm up at five every day. So I'm like, if I'm asleep at 10, that's seven hours, I can handle that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a struggle cause I also have dogs and they wake me up in the middle of the night, uh, you know, uh, which is, I love them so much, but they're so fucking annoying sometimes. What kind of dogs? So fucking annoying. I have Australian cattle dogs, blue Australian healers. Cattle dogs? Okay. Yeah. They're so cute. They're yeah. so mean, so naughty. They're so cute. I love them so much. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, uh, I I am trying to get better at sleeping. Like Je- Jesse Burdick and I actually talk a lot about creating better sleep habits. Like he's always on me about, he's like, you got to stop watching The Office to go to sleep. Like you got to stop doing this. You got to do this. You got to do this. And so I try, I try to implement and then I go to sleep. Like last night I went to sleep. I didn't take any melatonin. I took, uh, like sometimes I take Tylenol PM. I didn't take anything. Uh-huh. I just, I just tried to go to sleep. Didn't watch The Office, slept for about... 32 minutes, <laughs> woke up and was awake for like three hours. Uh, Damn. A question for you. Two questions, actually. As far as your sleep's concerned, um, do you have any like blue blocking glasses at all that you use at night or not? Nah? No. You know, I keep looking at them to buy them. That's, we'll get you some. You'll get we'll, me we'll, some. We'll get, you, we'll get some oh, okay. sent out to you because yeah, we, we I've been, use that shit. I've been looking at that a lot lately because I, I feel my friends swear by them and I'm like... I think I look cute in glasses. I wear them. Especially if you find yourself looking at screens at night, which yeah. I do too. Like the, those screens, the blue light from it, that shit can that shit can fuck yeah. with you falling asleep and staying asleep. Yeah. Even when I like, I have the the brightness turned all the way down. Mm-hmm. I have it on like the sleep tones, but it's still 
It's still not good. The enough. glasses are just a good cue and a yeah. good reminder. Like, hey, it's time to go to fucking bed. Yeah, I try. Yeah. I try to remember. I wrote myself like a, a list yesterday to put up above my stove that says like, take your magnesium. You know, like mm-hmm. do all these things before bed. And then yesterday, I, so I wrote it yesterday morning. <laughs> Looked at it last night while I made my dinner. Went, ah, nah. <laughs> I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> Didn't Dude, do anything. Fuck all that. <laughs> yeah. Didn't do you know do if you snore? Uh, so I have asthma and uh, chronic allergies and mild sleep apnea. So I 100% snore. Like, okay. <sighs> yeah. I sleep with my mouth open. Mm-hmm. Terrible. I actually, I'm trying to get uh, surgery on my sinuses soon and hopefully that fixes you that. have a hard time breathing in and out of your nose oh yeah i have a uh, like a 95 percent blockage in my left nostril oh jesus uh, and then i have From getting yeah. hit or allergies or combination uh everything i like mm. randomly developed asthma in 2018 which was pretty cool to get asthma as a 30 year old it's pretty, <laughs> it pretty awesome uh, like this will help my fuck. fighting career <laughs> oh, my yeah. yeah so <laughs> sick uh, <laughs> And then that kind of like everything spiraled after that. So, yes, yeah, so I'm trying to. I, I actually just started going to the doctor to see if I can get surgery on my mm. sinuses. And um, I got a CT scan and they said that I have one of the worst cases of nasal polyps that they've ever seen, which is pretty cool. So I think once I get the surgery and clean everything out and like straighten my septum, I mm. might be able to breathe. But they said that it might go back to that within five years. So I would just have to like keep having surgeries but i'll probably be retired from combat sports in five years so i don't think i'm going to care about it as much have you tried hanging upside down no should i no i just <laughs> <laughs> i was like damn i haven't heard about this yeah, yet hold either. on <laughs> i feel like that would make everything worse because i know when i'm like <laughs> when i'm on a massage table face down like oh, oh my yeah, God, yeah that's the, the worst. worst why does that happen uh-huh. what is that like everything just ends up in your face yeah, yeah mm-hmm. i don't know it sucks it's so weird i don't know i get snot and drool everything just comes out too. Well, that's gr- i wasn't gonna say no, that I, but that's gross no but like <laughs> i don't get massages but the last time i was on one of those beds i was just like fuck i need tissue because that yeah. shit's mm-hmm. getting i said i just jam i, I was up leaking there. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> what you got andrew got anything over there well you had said that you were gonna ask a tough question i'm not sure if you got Ooh. it out yet I like tough questions. Uh, I think I forgot what Fuck. it was. Fuck. God matter. damn it. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll ask an easy one. Uh, just your diet. Like, what's that like these days? <laughs> Let's go. This is fun. This is fun. <laughs> I'm the worst person to talk about <laughs> diet and recovery. So I've been on. So since since Coach made me go back up to 130. Okay, I used to always fight at 135, yeah. and I was like, in Australia, food's really good. So I was a little husky, you know. <laughs> 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 and then. <laughs> And then I moved to the US and food's not as good here. I'm really sorry, America, but it's just it's just not as good. Like I have I, I have less desire to eat out here than what I did back home. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started fighting a weight class lower. So then I had to run long distance every day. So I was very uh, little. And then coach made me go back up a weight class and I like struggled to put weight on. I couldn't get past, I, he made me fight at 135 again. I couldn't get heavier than 143. Like I was stuck at 143 for like a year and a half. So then I just started stuffing my face full of burgers and now I eat pasta every day. Nice. Um, and now I'm pretty consistently 148. Like I still can't, I'm, I'm trying to put weight on, you know, cause I'm so little for 135 like i last last fight week i cut in water less than two pounds you know whereas most of these girls are cutting eight to ten mm. and i cut less than two so i'm like little i'm on the eternal quest to get jacked <laughs> yeah. yeah so i eat a lot of bacon a lot of pasta uh-huh yeah it's good for you a lot of six ice creams at a time apparently hey, you're an elite athlete you mm-hmm. burn a lot of fucking calories. Mm-hmm. You can do that. That's shit. what it is. And you know what it was like? It was so weird. When I turned 31, my body just went from storing everything to processing. Like it was, it literally felt like an overnight thing where like I had to, I had to really watch what I ate, you know, yeah. in my twenties. Like if I ate anything off, I was chubby, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I'm in my thirties and I'm, I like the other day I ate, two full meal pasta meals and six ice creams and I woke up two pounds lighter, you know? <laughs> so it's like it, everyone, all the girls at the gym get so mad at me because every time that happens, I come in and I'm like, hey, guess what happened last night, you know? And I'm like, I ate a whole family sized lasagna. <laughs> and I then I come that. in and I have abs and they're like, what the fuck? Like everyone gets so mad at me. Yeah. But it is, it's like I turned 31 and my body just went like, hey, let's, all this hard work that you've done, like we're going to, 
we're going to let it pay off now. I think I need to chill out because I feel like as I get into my 40s, mm. it's probably not going to work that way. Or it just might get even better for you. Maybe I'll just be right. jacked all the time. Yeah. I won't even <laughs> need to take steroids to do strong <laughs> competitions. I'll just be a strong man. Let's go. There'll always be a need for steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Sure thing. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Oh, uh, please man. drop us some comments down below and make sure you guys like today's episode and subscribe if you guys are not subscribed. Uh, please follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z. And also, you're not the first Australian that had said that Australia's food is just happens to be better than what we have here in the it's States. It's so true. Yeah, so it's definitely true. And Seema, where are you at? And Seema Inning on Instagram and YouTube. And Seema Yinning on TikTok and Twitter. Go to the Discord, join. It's popping over there. Jesse, where can people I find couldn't you? even understand what you said. Hey, it's because that's, that's just, it just <laughs> rolls so out. <laughs> it just rolls out. It's because of his accent. It's because like I'm, I'm, like, I'm like mumbling everything. No, it's, it's, it's his accent. So smooth. Uh, yeah, <laughs> smooth panther. Miss Jesse Jess. Jesse with a Y. On everything. On everything. Yeah, on everything. At Mark Smelly Bell, strength is never weakness, weakness never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.